putting our hopes in your effort. <laughs> it seems to be working quite well. I kind of I keep scaling down the size of the neural network as well, and it's still hitting the same sort of yeah. threshold that I'm getting all the time. Well, my talk is going to talk about false positives too. And out here in New Mexico, we have low flying aircraft, which are bright and they exceed the velocity, angular velocity. So we catch those. And then sometimes I just get nothing. There's just nothing in the frame. Yeah. No, I was very looking forward to your talk as well, because I'm thinking, oh, maybe this will reduce the need for what I'm doing. Well, I, I think there's room for another generation of, of software. <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm not that new generation. I'll be 79 <laughs> next month. So I, <laughs> yeah. I, I'm not going to invest a whole lot of time. I looked at it and I said, oh, God, that's a whole new technology I, I don't want to learn. <laughs> yeah. Being completely honest, it's not like the most difficult thing in the world a lot of the stuff has been done kind of already yeah. and not doing too much coding it's just you know how it is with coding sometimes it's a little bit finicky unfortunately what i've seen is mostly in python and of all the languages i do it's oh this very very distant fourth mostly because of the libraries i can do simple python code but uh, oh, I've been doing doing programming since 1972, so like before there were microprocessors. Yeah, I, I've been lucky that I'm. I kind of Python is my one and only programming language. So uh, that's great. <laughs> well, I, just, I found it helpful to know more than just one. Oh yeah, for sure. I did a little bit of. C, but I wouldn't call myself competent in it. I only just kind of barely grazed the surface. Yeah. Uh, no, I find your talk very interesting. But, uh, Thank you. I just, I, I just can't put the effort into it. Hmm. I'm putting the effort into what I'm doing, <laughs> which you'll see. The sort of the biggest effort that was made in this though was people actually just um, like I said identifying the meteors themselves, and I would be able to do that without yeah. the rest of you guys, the rest of you volunteers. The reason I like it because if I have to by eye tell them between an airplane, a satellite, and uh, a bug, and a meteor. Mm -hmm. I've got it down pretty good, but I don't think I'm perfect. No one can ever be perfect. We can try, but we're probably not going to get anywhere close. <laughs> I'm way past it. <laughs> that banana peel is not too far away. <laughs> Richard, I'm, I'm glad you stayed around for this session because my talk may kind of intersect with some of what you talked about before you came on, and we really need a a good solution that's applicable in a lot of different geographic areas, in fact. Okay, yeah, well, glad to be here. But yeah, this is, I'm, I'm kind of a glue that puts people together. I don't actually do anything. <laughs> glue is a pretty good thing to be. Yeah, yeah. Pete's, Pete is more of the glue and the and. So, so Derek, uh, you wanted to share your slides, so you have to share oh, your own screen, right? Yeah, if, if, if you could, so I'll just try out this PowerPoint. But uh, yeah, right. we're very interested in uh, UK Mon here. We think it probably would have, there's a few different camera networks over here in Australia. We're just getting started. So, um, uh, so yeah, it'd be great. Um, yeah, so you're going to share a screen, Dennis, or? Uh, no, you have to do it. There's a green button at the bottom of the window. It says share screen. Oh, yes. Yeah. Okay. All right. So I'll share the screen. Yep. Okay. Now we've got it. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So that's, work, that's working okay, your end? Uh, no. Uh, no. I think. No? Okay. What have we got? 
Yeah, I think it asks you which screen down. to share and you have to kind of do another. Oh, okay. All right. So. And one trick that I just noticed is that if you're doing a, a PowerPoint or a LibreOffice version, you've got to have that full screen and share oh, yeah. that before you start your slideshow. Oh, okay. You just, only get a portion of it. Oh, hey, it's just all we're trying this out now. Eh? So. Um, I just ran across it. Yeah, I've got full screen, but then. Um, Okay, let's let's try that again. Um, yeah, just yep. Okay, there we go. Now, we, now, we've, now we've got it. Looking okay. good. That'll so work. And those, uh, so they're all working okay. And I, if I go to full screen, um, you guys over and see that there. Well, I'll just start your. Yeah, there you go. That's working okay. All right. Yes. All good. All right. Stop share. All right. Okay. We'll work it out. That's good. Awesome. Anyone else want to try their slides or everything's okay? Actually, I cheated. I tried mine because I got on first. Oh, that's right. <laughs> first shot session. Yeah. <laughs> Although I'm a little concerned. I, it looks though that that may have given me two different uh screen so we'll, we'll back it out here yeah okay this will work i think good oh, it's, it's so nice many of you guys sort of face face of well, not quite face to face but on the screen anyway so uh um yeah um i've got a lot of a lot of help from you guys on the on the forum so it's really nice to to meet you today so yeah it's always nice to put a face with a name Exactly, yeah. And maybe even a voice now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay, we have a few more minutes until the official start time. Um, and right. then we'll do a brief round of introductions and just kind of for um, sake of our participants from Australia, I'm just going to do a short recap of session one so they know what's up and if they're interested in. Um, um, well, listen to the whole talk. It's going to be uploaded uh, in a matter of minutes, so it's already uh, uploaded to YouTube. And I'm going to I'm going to post uh, the link to our mailing list. And yeah, thanks to well, all the folks from Europe who stuck around to meet the people from the other side of the world. Yeah, <laughs> it's great. Yeah. <clears throat> So I think we can probably, well, I'm going to just start with a short review of uh, the second session. And then gonna, during that time, a few more people are going to join. And then we're going to start with the introductions. So let me just very quickly share my screen here. Um, so in the second session, um, as I said, I'm going to give a short recap. That's going to be maybe 20 minutes or less, depending on how much I'm, I want to talk at the end of, end of my day. And after that, Paul Rogers is going to tell us about the Andromedids uh, in 2021 and the outburst seen by the GMN, um, which I'm looking forward to hearing. Uh, after that, we have Pete Eshman, who's going to talk about the New Mexico meteor array and their activities in the past year, and I guess plans for the next. Uh, and after a short break, we're going to hear from Bill Wallace, who's going to tell us about his uh, new meteor detector, uh, which uh, seems to be performing better than what we're currently using. And we're all very excited to hear about that. Um, and then Derek Poulton is going to tell us about a big fireball uh, and a meteorite fall uh, that, um, that occurred a couple of months ago close to his hometown, and he was involved in the search. And finally, we're going to be a recording from Gene Ross um, about his work on um, camera pointing optimization uh, to, to maximize basically overlap areas uh, between uh, different camera systems. Unfortunately, Gene couldn't be here today, so we have a recording. And uh, I don't know if Gene shared this with you, but mm -hmm. I could try to answer a few questions after that. Mm -hmm. But if they're too complicated, I'd just refer them to Gene. Yeah, yeah, I believe that he said that in his email. So okay, it's up to you how you want to handle. Yep, yep, that's that's fine. 
Um, okay, so I believe we have a good number of people here, but I would love to wait a few more minutes just to make sure that everyone who wants to participate is here before we officially begin. So we're just going to... Is there anyone from Western Australia here? Am I, am I the sole Australian representative on the screen? <laughs> I think I might be. I, I saw so. Jim Rowe earlier. So oh, yes. It, yeah. Okay. It, it was in Australia or close by. Yeah, New Zealand, I believe. Yeah. To us, that's the same. <laughs> that's a big mountain. <laughs> Not to us. <laughs> <laughs> No, there's that's, a difference. It's very I, far away. <laughs> you know, I made it to Woomera in 1974. Oh, there you go. Yeah, lovely place. Yeah, yeah right. Yeah. <laughs> Nothing for miles. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yes, yeah. Oh, there he is. Well, I did get to see a strange thing. Uh, a kangaroo, not in a cage. Yes, <laughs> should come here. We've got masses of them running, running around there in pest proportions. Here, they're in my garden every night. So, yeah. <laughs> are as are they as dangerous as Canadian bears? Or? Yeah. <laughs> uh, this in Europe. Yeah, people have uh, stories when they were. Searching for the the the, um, the Tagish Lake meteorite fall in 2000, and it happened in northern British Columbia. That's really kind of really remote areas of Canada, and um, there's there are people there who live in the middle of nowhere on their kind of little complex, and bears regularly visit their houses, and apparently one night. Uh, a bear was really pissed. They don't know what was happening, but just started tearing doors off buildings, just wrecking everything. And this guy's mother, basically, the bear broke into two sets of doors and was about, you know, three feet away from her. And then it, the bear took two shotgun slugs to die. It's this really, really bad situation. <laughs> Hopefully, kangaroos are more peaceful than that. Yes, yeah, right. <laughs> uh, I couldn't. We were over in Canada oh, a number of years ago. We couldn't understand why people walked around with bells in the bush when they were walking. <laughs> 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 so I understand why now after your description of that bear. So. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Apparently, uh, bears. You really need to have like a shotgun slug if you just hit them with like a a normal handgun or something, they just get pissed. They don't go down. <laughs> really dangerous animals. But they won't attack you if they're not provoked. Um, okay, well, enough about Canadian bears. Uh, I think this is our official start time and uh, we should probably start with the round of introductions. Uh, even though you might've introduced yourself in the first session, it'd be good if we, if we did it again, we have a total of 10 minutes to do it. So we just get to know each other. Um, I can begin, uh, I'm Dennis. I'm a postdoctoral associate at the University of Western Ontario in Canada. Um, the postdoctoral associate is basically when you finish your PhD and they decide if they're going to give you a job or not, or if you're just going to give up your dreams and go work for actual money. Um, okay. <laughs> so that's right. Um, so who wants to go next? Uh, I ask you to put your hand up on, um, uh, in zoom, there's a little button, uh, where you can do that. So, uh, yeah, under reactions, and then I believe raise hand. Okay, so let's start with uh, Pete Eshman. Um, yeah, my name is Pete Eshman. I'm here in New Mexico, Albuquerque, New Mexico, and uh, I'm giving a talk a little bit later on about our New Mexico meteor array. Uh, and this is, we've been at it for three or four years now. Feels like longer than that, but. <laughs> At any rate, I look forward to uh, hearing what, what you all have to say. Thanks, Pete. Uh, Paul Rogermans. Hello, I am Paul. I'm from Belgium. 
and participating in the CAMS network and in the Global Nuclear Network. And I will have a talk later on about uh, Andromedis. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Uh, Derek. Uh, yes, I'm Victoria in Australia. I'm a retired soil scientist, but I've worked mainly in the water industry. Um, uh, became an operator of, became very interested in um, in meteors because I don't live very far from the Murchison meteorite. Uh, so there's a lot of interest there in the Murchison meteorite. We've had visits from scientists, etc. Um, so I've had a camera up for about six, six months and um, recently put one up for my brother-in-law as well. Global not work here, so we're going to see a, a rapid expansion in cameras uh, and operators, I hope, in the near future. So uh, fantastic program, guys. You've done, you've done a great job with them. Awesome. Thanks, Derek. Uh, Alex McConaughey. Hi, I'm Alex. I'm from Southern California. I've got two cameras, one pointing east over eventually the California desert and the other pointing south uh, over San Diego area. Um, and um, I've been at it for about, oh, a year now, I guess. So I, I'm part of the Southern California group working with Bob Massey. Awesome, thank you. Uh, Steve Welch. I'm Steve and uh, let's see, I, I'm, uh, I'm with Pete. <laughs> Pete, and I, Pete and I basically were, were the first people in, in New Mexico that uh, sort of started running with this ball. So and, uh, it's, a, it's a very interesting ball indeed. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks to you. Uh, Fiaker. Hi, I'm Fiaker. I'm a final year undergraduate student doing physics and astronomy, and I've been um, working on a machine learning project using GMN data, and I'm just very interested to see what the rest of you guys are doing. Awesome. Thanks. Uh, Bill Wallace. I'm, uh, I'm with uh, Steve and Pete. I, I, Steve gave me my camera. I've had it for a couple of years. I've uh, s s dropped my Pi 3 for a Pi 4, and then I went from a Pi 4 to a uh, bigger machine so I can have this extra computing power. <laughs> I'm a retired software engineer. Awesome. Thanks, Bill. Uh, Chuck Pollan. Okay. Um, well, I can talk at least. I don't seem to be able to get my video to start. Oh, there we go. Uh, my name is uh, Chuck Pullen. I'm in uh, South Central Washington State. I have one camera going and am trying to get another one going to uh, provide trajectory information on the first one and eventually may well have a network here out in the middle of nowhere uh, in uh, central Washington. I'm a retired uh, uh, health professional and I have a master's in astronomy, but uh, nothing like this. Take care. Awesome. Thanks, Chuck. Uh, Bob Massey. Hi, uh, Bob Massey here. Um, as Alex mentioned, uh, we're, we're both in uh, Southern California, kind of a splinter group from the New Mexico, Mexico group. Uh, Pete and uh, Steve and others there kind of helped us out quite a bit, including and Dennis as well. We've got a total of seven cameras, uh, including one in southern Utah, and cover the southeastern corner of, of the state of California and are starting <clears throat> to uh, interface with uh, the Lowell group uh, as well. And we're looking forward to uh, adding more cameras as time goes by. And, just want to add, I don't know that how many are here from this morning, but uh, just excellent presentations this morning. We really appreciate it. Awesome. Thank you, Bob. Um, Pete Graham. Oh, hi, I'm um, Pete Graham, and I live in the south of the North Island in New Zealand, uh, Martinborough. I've got I had one camera up going for about six months, and it's sort of pointing northeast. Um, there are four other people in New Zealand with cameras. Bob is going to talk later. He will, he's down in the south. Um, I'm a retired electrical engineer uh, specializing in radio, but and got into this through my amateur astronomy group 
who discovered that the network was up. And so uh, I set up, a, as I say, my first station six months ago. So looking forward to hearing about how we can work together and uh, orient, orient our cameras in a, a coordinated way. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Bob. Yeah, hi, I'm Bob Evans. I live in Invercargill, which is on the south coast of New Zealand's South Island. I think that makes me the southernmost station in the network. Uh, I've got one camera. I'm hoping to get another one. Um, and uh, still on a steep learning curve at all, but it's very fascinating. I'm sort of just... Um, Winter nights are too cold for me, and summer nights are too late before it gets dark. So this is a perfect solution. And uh, also, got to thank Jim Rowe up there for getting me into it, even though he's in the UK. <laughs> awesome. Thanks, Bob. Uh, Pierre. Oh, is Pierre there? It, it appears not, so, okay. Uh, ah, yes, okay, oh, you're okay. Here. Go ahead. Uh, I joined the network just, just, okay. So I, I'm Pierre from Belgium, and I'm joining the network just one year uh, ago with one camera, and I am also a variable star observer and member of the AVSO. Thank you, Pierre. Uh, John Briggs. Hi there. Um, I'm in uh, West Central New Mexico. And uh, for some years, I ran a video system uh, with the help of uh, Chris Peterson in Colorado, uh, but I ran it mainly for fun. This was just so fascinating. And thanks to um, uh, Peter and uh, his friends uh, uh, in Albuquerque and in here in New Mexico, I built uh, uh, one of one of these cameras, but unfortunately, my my rural home has limited uh, internet access. So I've turned the camera over to my friend um, uh, Eric Toops, who got a camera of his own, and he has them both running uh, uh, in a in a slightly more civilized place with um, a better internet access for the big data download every every morning, as I understand. And meanwhile, you have all progressed with these things so technically. I have, I think I have a lot of catching up to do to understand uh, the technicalities of what everybody is doing with this. But uh, it's been a wonderful meeting today. And thank you very much. Well, thank you, John. Um, David. Good morning, Dave Rowlandson. I live in Western Australia. Um, I got involved through the network through a post I saw on Twitch, and it just seemed quite interesting. Initially, we put one camera up at Perth Observatory, which was followed by six more on a 60 degree spacing, and then one uh, 25 mil camera paired with a camera of mine down in Baldivis, which is about 100 k to the south. The cameras in Baldivis are generally used for test purposes, and then they get deployed around Western Australia. And we're hoping to build a network of maybe 20 cameras or so over the next two or three years. Awesome. Thank you, David. Uh, and finally, Jim Rowe. Oh, uh, hello, Dennis. Good to uh, see you again. Um, I'm Jim Rowe. I'm currently in Christchurch in New Zealand in a hotel room. I'm originally from New Zealand, but live in the UK. Uh, I've been there for about 30 years or so. Um, Richard Kasarek taught me everything I know about meteors about five years ago. He was very patient with me. And since then, um, we've just gone from strength to strength in UK Mon, but also in UK4, which is pulling together all the different networks in the UK and trying to find um, meteorites and trying to get them to work together. And I'm really keen to, I've, I've been talking to a lot of people in New Zealand as well. So it'd be really interesting to see if that sort of model can translate um, to New Zealand. So Bob, I'll be really interested in what you've got to say later on. But that's Awesome, thank you, Jim. Uh, so Jim was the last person with his hand up. Uh, is there anyone else who wants to introduce themselves before we uh, continue with our um, meeting going once going twice i think we probably got everyone okay well uh the second item for today 
uh, is uh, a short summary of the first session. So I'm just going to very quickly go through the list of uh, talks and describe what uh, every talk was. And I'm just going to very quickly run through my uh, my presentation. So this is just simply to entice you to actually watch the video of the first session that uh, is going to be uploaded to YouTube uh, very shortly, or probably already is in uh, another tab in the background. So basically, the first uh, um, this first speaker was me, and I just basically gave a very short introduction to meteor science. Uh, why meteors are so important uh, and what kind of different types of material arrive on Earth. And these are, you know, like asteroids deliver meteorites, they deliver rocks, and comets produce meteor showers. And these are just completely two fundamentally different things. And when someone says meteor, well, they basically describe both phenomena, but they're just so different. And um, we get hit by asteroids every once in a while. So that's why I want to know about them. And that's why we're kind of doing this, this whole meteor thing, because we want to learn more about objects that are a potential threat to human life on Earth. Um, and also comets contain basic ingredients uh, of life. So that's also pretty cool to study. And if we want to be a spacefaring civilization, we want to make sure that the little dust particles won't hit us and cause any trouble like that it did in the past but this time we got to be prepared. Um, and then I talked briefly about uh, the science of meteorites called meteoritics. Uh, and I said that if you ever go to Vienna, you should definitely visit their Natural History Museum. They have a wonderful meteorite exhibit, actually the biggest in the whole world. That's a place that you should you know, put on your bucket list. list. I described how to tell earth rocks and meteorites apart, and it's usually very hard. Uh, and the only real way to do it is if you have a lab and you can stick it uh, under, uh, under an instrument that can do this. Um, and also why meteorites are important to um, basically, they help us understand the origins of the solar system and how everything that we know is was created from basically a cloud of gas and how we're trying to piece together the story of our origins and trying to kind of extrapolate that, that to other uh, extrasolar systems to you know better understand how other planets like Earth can be created in other places and you know can life start on other um, on other planets and other solar systems, which would be very, very exciting to, to understand and know. And I also talked about how meteorites can be used to reconstruct the, the processes that form the solar system, and basically how the different type of meteorite comes from a different uh, different parts of uh, an asteroid and can basically tell us everything about the, the, the process that created the planets. Um, and then I talk about the structure of the asteroid belt, et cetera, et cetera. I'm just going to skip this. If you're interested, please watch the, the first part of the show. And uh, after you watch this, you're going to realize why people are spending hundreds of millions of dollars trying to recover samples from asteroids and that there actually is a, a much cheaper way to let's just wait for the rock to arrive to us instead of going there. Uh, and this is exactly what we're trying to do with the Global Media Network um, and what some other groups are doing around the world. Um, and uh, there there is a room for you to participate and that's why we're running this project. So the fundamental uh, reason why we're trying to do this is because out of tens of thousands of meteorites that exist in collections, only about 40 to 50 were observed falling through the atmosphere. And if you observe the fall, you know the meteor's trajectory and then you can extrapolate the orbit and you know exactly where it came from in the solar system. So, so no need to send the expensive spacecraft, you just know where it came from and you have this big, big, big piece of rock here. And we just want to have hundreds of uh, meteorite falls with observed orbits. So, you know, we have a much better picture uh, of the asteroid belt and the creation of the solar system. 
Uh, in the second part of the talk, I talked about um, the papers that we published that we developed a very important new method of calibrating our data. And that's about two times better than anything else that was previously published. And this is all open source. This is all free. We provided this for, for everyone. And that basically enables us to, to pinpoint trajectories of big fireballs very accurately and then able to predict uh, fall locations of, of meteorites to a very high degree of accuracy. And this software um, came into existence just a month or two before the, the Winchco meteorite fall in the UK, where um, we were able to assimilate data from all the various meteor networks that exist in the UK into um, to do the measurements on the such large uh, heterogeneous data and produce a very accurate uh, meteor trajectory of a meteorite that is incredibly rare, incredibly important, uh, was one of the most pristine meteorites ever recovered. Um, and uh, here I demonstrated that with the new improved uh, method that we developed and the global meteor network cameras that are very sensitive, what we can do is actually measure the final mass of the rock when it's falling through the atmosphere and very accurately, accurately predict the location. So this is actual winchcomb data. And I said, we have a very cool method where you can basically go in and measure the deceleration of the, the, the fireball in the atmosphere at the end. And if you know the deceleration, the speed, the air density, and you assume a meteorite density, they're all kind of about the same. You can estimate the final mass of the body of the, the meteorite that uh, that fell. And from the measurements, the estimates were between 200 and 500 grams, and the actual find was about 300 grams. So that's spot on. And this is just kind of the first one for which uh, we were able to do this. And from now on, for all the future falls, we can very accurately pinpoint uh, the final mass and the, the final fall location. Um, Winchcomb is interesting uh, for many different reasons. The main one is basically it's probably the softest material that was ever delivered through the atmosphere from the asteroid belt. It just had a very unique set of circumstances. It was able to survive the atmospheric flight, which usually removes over 99% of mass that travels through the atmosphere. But this one was just very lucky that it survived. And that's why it's important because it's just so uh, weak and pristine. Uh, we had a very interesting talk about uh, calibrating a daytime meteorite fall, which is usually very hard to do, but we developed a method, a software, where we were able to kind of look at buildings and signposts and do a very accurate calibration using methods that were kind of similar to surveying. Um, and then after that, we, uh, oh, all right, go next slide. And then I talked about meteor shower work, uh, talked about comets and why they're important. And um, I'm just going to skip this whole section, but we did one paper with collaborators from NASA and they were able to do something they never done before, which is really cool. Uh, we observed some meteor shower outbursts. Uh, Paul is going to talk about the Andromedids and probably the biggest thing that you're going to hear about in the next couple of months in terms of the upgrades to the GMN is going to be uh, the GMN flux module. So this is basically going to uh, enable us to not only observe orbits of meteors as they enter the atmosphere, but very accurately count how many meteors are entering the atmosphere per unit area per hour. So this is usually kind of hard to calibrate, but we developed some new software that's going to be able to provide uh, the numbers in semi real time. And this is something that's going to be used operationally by uh, certain space agencies. Um, and I just want to mention Paul Rogerman's um, paper that's going to come out on Meteor News very soon, where he's going to do a very detailed review of, uh, of the, the, the advances that the Global Media Network did in, uh, in the previous year. And that was basically the end of my talk. I thanked all the 350 plus people who participate in the network. And my talk was followed by um, was followed by uh, student presentations. And students were, let me just very quickly check the time. Great, we have 10 more minutes. 
So we're followed by student presentation. Uh, presentations, Young Kipreos, she told us about the daytime sextanted meteor shower. Basically, the Geminids, you probably know about them. They're one of the most spectacular meteor showers that you can see. The problem is they happen in December, so it's kind of cold out and the weather is usually bad. Uh, but they're really weird because they come from an asteroid, they're not a comet, and when we look at the asteroid, the, the asteroid is not active enough to explain the number of meteors that we're seeing, so there's a big of a big, big mystery there. Uh, but she's using global meteor network data to uh, observe a, um, a sister shower, the daytime sextanteds, uh, for which we have a few rare observations, and they also have a connection to the Geminids. Um, Marco Chagon talked about the NOAA Mesto meteorite fall. That's a daytime fireball. Developed some interesting new methods of calibration. Um, Fikra Fihili, uh, he talked about deep learning to classify uh, meteor images from false positives. So as you might have noticed, your cameras sometimes produce false positives, just like detections in clouds or birds and bats or whatever. And he's trying to use very advanced machine learning methods to uh, filter out the, you know, uh, the good stuff from the bad stuff. Uh, that was followed by Ricky Bassan's presentation where he's developing a data pipeline for the global media network. So for example, this is going to be important for um, if we want to have scientists use global meteor network data and they already do we need to provide a very nice way of, of using the data so currently uh you might already know that that we have our data in a big text file on our website and that's very clunky uh, but we, what he's trying to provide is a very kind of nice interface of interacting with the data and filtering the data set uh, Pedro presented a very interesting talk about uh, the MOMET device. So basically they put, I think, five or six meteor cameras in a suitcase. And if there's a rare meteor shower that's going to occur and you don't want to miss it, what you do is you take that suitcase, bring it to the top of a, top of a mountain or a hill, and you're going to, you know, you won't be clouded out and you run it, you collect your observations and you take the suitcase down. And they did exactly that for one meteor shower and they were observing in Chile uh, in the middle of nowhere. So it was really exciting. Uh, Tamoyan, he talked about an observation of a Starlink re-entry in Spain. Um, just one Starlink satellite, not related to the recent uh, ones that were taken down by the, uh, the solar storm, uh, uh, basically re-entered the atmosphere and burned up, and he was able to reconstruct the trajectory. Uh, and then Paul talked about how um, RMS cameras uh, basically came to the rescue of the project that he was working in or still, still participating in, uh, CAMS uh, Benelux, um, and basically some of the things that he pointed out were the reasons why we even started the project, because we noticed that some old technology was no longer compatible and we couldn't buy some parts and just have to come up with something new. Uh, Richard talked about how the UK media network expanded in the last year by over 100 new cameras and how the Winchcomb meteorite fall was basically the catalyst uh, for, for this big change here. I think by the, the end of this year, they plan to have over 200 new cameras. There's going to be one, you know, per every square kilometer in the UK, as far as I understand. And Mark McIntyre talked about how he created this amazing website, uh, website interface, where basically every meteor that's recorded by the UK Meteor Network uh, is shown on their website and the general public can search for the images. And it's a really, really neat interface and that got many more people interested uh, in this project than it would be otherwise, uh, that would otherwise be reached. And um, finally, there was an unstructured workshop slash Q&A when we talked about everything. I was uh, a combination of just, you know, people wanted to know more about certain things to uh, suggestions, what to improve, to airing of grievances, basically uh, a whole uh, gamut of uh, different discussions. And if you're interested, you can watch it in uh, the YouTube video. So that was a very, very quick, um, very quick overview of everything that happened in uh, the first session. And 
before we go on to the, the next talk uh, by Paul Rogerans, I would be very happy to take any questions or quick suggestions by any uh, any any current uh, participants. If this was really fast and confusing, I'm very sorry. But the first there's a recording of the first uh, session that's five hours long. So when you're really bored and you have nothing else to do. It's going to be something for you to watch. Okay. Um, so we have about five minutes until Paul's uh, talk, and uh, I want to um, maybe uh, if we well we have no reason to really very accurately keep to the schedule. So I think we can start with Paul's talk unless there are other questions or comments. Okay, so Paul, please go ahead. Okay, I will share my screen. Yep, we can see it. Yeah. Okay, so the Andromedids, something you need to know about the history of it, that's the parent comet, Biela, was discovered in the early 19th century, and at its return in 1846, Astronomers saw it uh, separated in uh, two different parts. Astronomers literally saw a comet falling apart. At its next return, it was seen for a last time, and since then, no trace of the comet anymore. But what's important is the dust of this comet caused two meteor storms in 1872 and 1885, when up to 100 meteors per minute occurred. Later, it uh, occurred that this uh, shower was even active in other years before, and the last outburst was seen in 1892. Curiously, in the 20th century, it looked as if the Andromedids had completely vanished, no trace of them, apart from some uh, small activity every year. Strange enough, the last outburst before occurred on 5 December 2011, and that was recorded by the Camps Network and Seymour Radar uh, in Canada, and got listed as a new meteor shower, the December C Cassiopeis. Now, it's a very difficult stream to make predictions apparently, because in 2018, a possible dust trail was predicted that did not materialize. However, unexpectedly, last year, we got Andromedics and many. Global Media Network identified as many as 1,034 orbits as Andromedics. Uh, but what can we learn from the data obtained by uh, Global Media Network? Well, the shower identification done by Global Media Network has been done based on a known list of meteor showers according, according to some rules that is uh, taken into account. But there is another method, a method based on similarity of orbits. So what I did, I took all the meteors in that time spell, there are uh, 76,000 uh, orbits available, and I checked with a mean orbit that I obtained for these 1,034 orbits that were identified as Andromedids, and I took the similarity of each orbit into account compared to this mean orbit. Now, the similarity criteria are just a number. The smaller the number, the better the similarity. So, zero is identical orbit. If it goes above uh, 109, that means there is practically no similarity. Now, what came out? Can we Consider something like activity profile. Yes. Well, if we take the mean orbit as a reference orbit and we see these different de uh, degrees of similarity of the orbits, then we can see there is some activity here in the beginning of the period, but low activity. We have a clear peak here and have a third very sharp peak in the end. And note the activity ends abruptly. And that's because 
probably in the reference list used by Global Media Network, the activity period of the Andromedids ends here at, at this uh, spot. If I use my similarity criteria on the orbits, we see that we detect Andromedids much earlier and also much later. That's interesting to know, or later. Now, let's look at radiant. Normally, the Earth moves through a meteor stream, and if the orbits of the meteor stream particles are more or less parallel, we should see a nice radiant drift. We should see uh, all the radiance uh, obtained some way along a straight line. But look how they appear. That's very weird. It's no line, it's more kind of crescent. And note these uh, December sea Cassiopeids appear here on top of them. Here is the beginning of the activity and towards the end they get here. That's very rare. If we look at the similarity criteria, we see something similar, except that we get much more scattered. We recognize much more orbits as possible Andromedid orbits. There is a way to eliminate a radiant drift, and that's to look at sun-centered ecliptic coordinates. And if that goes well, if the orbits are really parallel, we should see a huge concentration here in the middle. We don't see that. We see it stretched. And here we have again this December C Cassiopeis. So there is another mechanism disturbing and compensating the normal radiant drift that we may expect normally. Then let's look at the orbital elements in function of time. We use the function of time in solar longitude. And for the people who are not familiar with uh, these terms like uh, orbital elements, I made a sketch aside and put a line of text on top that you can more or less see about what we are speaking. Perihelion distance, you see it's increasing. And at the end, the green line, that are these uh, December C Cassiopeis. Look how they line up very well. And the, diff, the distance between the beginning where the Earth enters, starts to encounter Andromeda, and at the end, that's a distance, a difference in perihelion distance of about 25 million kilometers. That's huge. If we look at the semi-major axis, that remains pretty stable, apart from the scatter, but that's normally a very sensitive element, so don't look too much at that. But if we look at the eccentricity, we see it tends to decrease slightly, which is more or less normal. If this increase and that's stable, this should increase also. If you look at the histogram, it's not a nice distribution. It looks almost like we put two distributions on top of each other. It's a little bit skewed. Then, if we look at the inclination of the orbit, we see again the inclination increases a lot during the transit of the Earth through the stream. Then, if we look at the longitude of perihelion, we see again strange change in the orbital element. Now, we can also have a look at the velocity. The velocity doesn't stay stable through the transit of the Earth. In the beginning, in the first instant, we encounter the most fast Andromedids, and towards the end, we encounter the slow Andromedids. And again, look at this green, this December C Cassiopeis. Also, this distribution, the histogram, is Q. That is not what I used to see with other meteor streams. We can also look at the velocity a little bit in function of the radiant, the radiant area. Well, here we see the fastest Andromedids at the beginning of the transit of the Earth through the meteor stream. Uh, we see the fastest Andromedids. Towards the end, we see the slower ones. And here are again these uh, December C Cassiopeids. If we look at the result obtained with the similarity criteria, the orbit similarity, we see more or less the same shape and same distribution, except the similarity criteria identify many more orbits as possible to Andromedids. Now, if we look at the radiant in the equatorial coordinates, normally we should see a clear radiant drift, so the right ascension should increase quite well. And it does to some extent, but not as much as we would expect. 
it does climb a lot in declination, but kite ascension almost remains stable over the period. Very strange, the December Cassia pits, they seem even to go the, the other way. That's very, very strange. Now, if we look at the, the sun-centered ecliptic coordinates, normally, if the orbits should be parallel, they should be a nice horizontal line. But you see, there is another mechanism going on. It's also showing a serious degree of uh, drifting. Now, I told you in the beginning, we took one mean orbit for the entire activity period. But what happens if we take a mean orbit every five degrees in solar longitude? Uh, can that help to detect, for instance, where we have some maxima or submaxima? We can clearly see there is something going on here in the early two weeks of the activity. And then we have clearly here a peak. And finally, we have a very sharp peak at the end of the activity period. And that's where the, here that's where the about uh, 248 in solar longitude that's about where the global meteor network does not detect any andromedids anymore well you see there are really very nice uh, andromedid orbits after this solar longitude and the activity goes on beyond this time so what can we conclude the Andromedids are a very highly perturbed meteor stream. So the orbits somehow got smeared out in a way that the, even the, the classic radiant drift is some way uh, compensated. We don't see the expected radiant drift. With some iterative procedure, I could locate at least three dust components that were mainly responsible for the 2021 orbits for each of these components. I think if you make another approach on all the data set of this stream, maybe fear a little bit, but I expect it will be close to what I find here. And in fact, whether we use the direct identification by Global Meteor Network according to a reference list, or we use the orbit similarity method to identify Andromedids, it does not make really a difference in the final result. Finally, the December Psi Cassiopids are in fact Andromedids. For me, it's still a mystery why Peter Jeninskis invented a new meteor stream name for this appearance in 2011. And I raised the question, does it make sense to define new meteor streams for each substream of such a complex, let's say? That's an open question. So that's, that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Paul, for a wonderful talk. Yeah, so the Andromedids are definitely very interesting. I can, um, I can probably very quickly show what the global media network actually saw during the, the Andromedids. And so usually meteor showers are on this radiant plot, just a, a blob that doesn't move much. However, for the Andromedids, there was like a, a very, an, an arc that lasted for a very long time. So, you know, we believe that this is because the comet Bailey uh, disintegrated in the 1600s into many different you know, pieces and because of just dynamical perturbations in the solar system, because of the gravity of the planet, just kind of brought it into a larger range of, of inclinations. Um, but yeah, the, the good question is, why do we keep defining different meteor showers if it's just the same, same thing? And I think that probably back then we didn't really know that much about it or good quality data didn't exist to really connect this as a part of one complex. I mean, we can also look at the Orionids, for example, if we go to, uh, if we go to uh, October and you can see the Orionids are a blob here, but really very old uh, particles from a comet Halley, it's just, they continue down in like a tail. And we're basically seeing the exact same thing for, uh, for its sister shower. So again, this brings us back to the question, what is a meteor shower? We don't know. 
there isn't still in any, you know, very rigorous definition, but to really make that definition, we really need to collect more data and do exactly what you're doing, Paul, is not trust automated classification and really go in and look very deeply into the data set and, and understand what's going on. Uh, are there any other questions? We're running a bit over time, but it doesn't matter. I think we're very flexible here. Uh, are there any questions for Paul? Okay, uh, if not, let's hear uh, Pete Eshman's talk. Pete, go ahead. Oh, uh, is there a hand up? No, no, okay, Pete, go ahead. Is that visible? Yep, we can see it. Okay. Hi, I'm Peter Eshman, and I'd like to share some information about the New Mexico Meteor Array. I'm going to cover some very basic information. I'm also going to cover some extensions that we've made that might possibly be added to the GMN RMS uh, error checking. We have 23 GMN stations in our array, which we abbreviate as NMMA. We're located in the southwestern US. Camera coverage is centered near the intersection of interstate highways I-25 and I-40 in the Albuquerque metro area. Our meteor camera array measures about 420 kilometers north-south by 225 kilometers east-west. Red pins show our array stations. Yellow pins show Lowell Observatory Project Window Rock and Sun Zona stations. At each of their stations, they host six co-located cameras. So here are the red pins in this approximate area. This would be the Window Rock Lowell station and the Sun Zona Lowell stations. We have uh, 13 station owner operators in eight cities, totaling 23 stations, with two more that may join us soon. This slide shows totals for January from Tamayan's excellent website. Orange lines show New Mexico state boundaries. Green lines show the US-Mexico border. We have a little bit of the Pacific Ocean showing up on the uh, lower left-hand corner. This area here basically represents the New Mexico cloud. This area would be essentially the Lowell Observatory cloud, reaching down probably below the bottom of the slide. And then this area would reflect the Southern California cloud, uh, and they've also got one station in Utah. The total distance here uh, that we're talking about to run from approximately this area down to approximately here is 1,400 kilometers. So this is a fairly big area. It all started with a message in February of 2018 on a local astronomy club list, which linked to a cloudy night forum posting from Dennis Vita and Mike Mazur. They had a link to an eBay camera offer, a Pi 3B with an IMX 225 camera. Matter of fact, that camera is still running, it's US 000E. I recall that the inside of the camera case is labeled serial number one, and it was signed by Dennis and Mike. So um, maybe that's a collector's item. In the fall of 2018, we ordered 14 stations from Dennis and Mike. Then in spring of 2019, we ordered parts to build 14 more stations and sent three to California. Early in 2021, we ordered parts to build more stations. Before I continue, I'd like to recommend some resources for those who are just starting out. Primary resources are the GMN Wiki, 
the UK Meteor Network RMS Wiki, and the Global Meteor Network Groups.io discussion group. Don't forget, you can run keyword searches on all of these resources. We use IMX 291 sensors with four millimeter lenses. Most of our stations have transitioned to four gig Pi 4s running Buster RMS. One of our stations upgraded to the Pi 400, which is one of the few available options now that Pi 4 are in scarce supply. Most stations have been upgraded to 128 gig micro SD cards, offering room for about five nights of captured data. Most stations have attached 256 gigabyte USB thumb drives for automated data backup. The Pi 4 is strongly preferred over the Pi 3. We've noticed that the Pi 3 suffer from loss of data, excessive processing times, and the Jesse RMS software mix seems much more prone to errors and crashes. Here we show the amount of data capture time that was lost by comparing the actual number of captured FITS files versus a predicted total. We show the Pi 3 results in blue with the Pi 4 results in red. Now, we're using a logarithmic scale here. This is one minute, 10 minutes, and 100 minutes. I understand that there may be around 100 Jesse RMS stations in GMN at present. Steve Kaufman, who's a major contributor to our group, is developing a record watchdog that may help to reduce Pi 3 data loss problems. I serve as an unofficial area coordinator for our Meteor Array, and I'd like to offer some recommendations based on my experience so far in this role. The main job of an area coordinator is to keep things on track. So monitor daily station status, making sure there's room for two or more capture directories so we don't miss a fireball discovered later, verifying station backups, running periodic backups to help with disaster recovery, and connecting by VNC to copy any new script files to each station. Tasks include helping with hardware and software problems, as well as station failures and upgrades. Acting as a central clearinghouse for information to and from Dennis, as well as to and from our GMN Groups IO discussion group. Coordinating with any other area coordinators, which in my case would be Nick Moskovitz in Arizona from the Lowell Project and Bob Massey in California. Most importantly, you need to distribute tasks throughout your group of station owners so you spread around knowledge and skills. Goals include develop documentation, encourage software development, educate new members, keep station owners informed. In our case, we conduct biweekly Zoom meetings and I try to send periodic emails to the group and then promote public outreach. Most importantly, automate tasks to reduce your workload. If you find you do, you're doing something that's very repetitive, try to automate these things with scripts and cron jobs where appropriate. Our external script was developed before IstraStream became part of the standard RMS image. Our script could be modified to include a call to IstraStream. Our external script calls helper scripts, time-lapse, my uploads, and backup to USB. We use it to automate collecting diagnostic data in our FITS counts TXT files, which include meter detection counts, counts of FITS files in the capture directory versus expected counts, checking directory counts of archive versus capture directories, and writing a message if the counts don't match, and warning if there's only room for one capture directory. After recording diagnostics, the external script then uploads a queue for data to our local server, optionally uploads to a station owner's site, backs up data to the station's thumb drive, and finally deletes data no longer needed from a micro SD card to free up space for recording. 
we've developed some tools to help um, keep our system going. Backup to help with disaster recovery, fix it to provide various ways to reprocess data, cam set to toggle cameras between night and day modes as needed, and flush NMQ to make sure data gets uploaded to our local server. Multi-station networks require task automation to reduce the workload on an area cord day. I use idle daytime periods to run cron jobs on my four gig Pi 4 US0002. This consolidates station diagnostics and status. I do this by viewing the last three lines of all the station's FITS count text files, which I mentioned earlier. Another cron job downloads station data from our local server and then uploads it to our aggregated data site, where it is presented in camera azimuth order, making it easier to spot shared events and catch any problems before they snowball. And this would be the link to our complex.org, our aggregated data site. I don't want to acknowledge some of our local, con con sorry, local contributors. Steve Kaufman maintains our local server. He wrote our external script, developed other utilities, and is writing the record watchdog for Jesse RMS. He also hosts our biweekly Zoom meetings. He runs stations US0006 and 0N. Jean Moraz helps with optimizing camera locations and camera orientations. He runs station 0L. I hope you can see his presentation, which I believe is the third talk scheduled after our break. Steve Welsh has helped me build and configure cameras and other hardware. He runs stations 8, 9, and R. Those are all 08, 09, and 0R. Bob Huffnagel helped by trimming visors on metal cases, soldering PoE wires, and making some of our PoE pigtails. He runs stations 07 and 0P. Thanks to a big group effort, we've managed to catch and fix many problems before too much data was lost. And best of all, we've had two events resulting in predicted stream fields. Woohoo! Thank you all for your time today. I'll try to answer any questions you may have now, or you can feel free to email me later. Awesome. Thanks, Pete. Yeah, Pete is not boasting enough. Um, their network observed two meteorite falls and they fell in pretty inaccessible terrain, but uh, people are working hard to try to recover those meteorites. But right now we can't really share the strewn field because we don't want meteorite hunters to, to be there and, and pick them up. We want meteorites to end up in a lab and not on eBay. <laughs> That's our goal. Uh, okay, are there any questions for Pete? So, um, yep, yeah. uh, any questions? Okay, I don't see any, uh, but- well, maybe, maybe they're no longer awake. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Paul, Paul has a question. Paul, go ahead. Uh, yes, Pete, uh, are you in contact with the people from camps in Texas? Uh, no, I don't have any contacts with people in Texas at the present time. Okay. Uh, I've not really tried to connect with the CAMS network people. I don't really have any good uh, good uh, people to, to ask about that. Uh, I know there are CAMS stations in both Arizona and Texas. There used to be some in New Mexico, but I'm not sure that they are still running at the present time. Mm -hmm. If you have contacts, uh, or want to try to get communication going between between us here and, and CAMS, uh, I'll be happy to uh, try to follow up on it. Yeah, I was thinking uh, about the Lowell Observatory. Uh, they are using RMS cameras at a large scale. Yes, and we are working with Nick Moskovitz with their project. Uh, in fact, we may be trying to help uh, uh, do a ground search for one of the uh, one of the falls that actually was detected by 
the Window Rock Station along with our station, Jay and Magdalena. So we definitely want to work with him. Uh, I've talked with him about whether he would like to expand into New Mexico, and it sounds like based on some of the constraints of their grant that they probably shouldn't be going too much beyond the Arizona border into New Mexico. But their addition of Window Rock and Sun Zona is, is huge. I mean, that really will help expand and connect the two clouds. Definitely. Uh, thanks, Paul, for the question. Uh, Derek has his hand up. Derek, go ahead. Uh, yeah, so you've done a fantastic job there, Peter. I, I uh, We're just sort of starting out in Victoria, but we're you're where we'd like to be in probably five or 10 years time, I think, but it's a lot of ideas there that I picked up on. Um, but I was just picking up on that, that issue of meteorite hunters that Dennis raised. Uh, how big an issue is that in, in America and here? I, I, uh, I'm a scientist. I was, you know, anything I find is going to be donated to science, but is it, is it a huge issue? Uh, I don't know. Well, I think Dennis, can probably speak to that better than I, but I do know that there are people that really try to find meteors on the ground for so that they can resell them or they just have a real obsession with getting those materials into their hands. So it's definitely an area that maybe caught me a little bit by surprise, although I should know better as a uh, retired field archeologist uh, that some resources you have to be very careful about locational information about cultural resources as well as um, things like meteorites. So, um, Dennis, do you have any anything you can add? There are people when they hear there's a fresh meteorite fall somewhere, they're ready to sit on a plane and fly to wherever in the world it occurred. And even if the local laws are saying that you're not allowed to take the meteorite out of the country, where they will smuggle it out, they will make sure just to put it on eBay and make that money. Uh, you know, I know I've seen meteorites uh, that came from Iran and places where it's you're not supposed to take meteorites out, and yet there they were, right? So people are just willing to to do everything just to. Um, just to get money, especially if a meteorite has a story, then it can be very, very expensive. Um, but yeah, it's it's a problem. So that's why we don't we're not really that keen uh, on sharing strewn fields with people who we can't trust. And one of the things that we're doing in terms of uh, network expansion is that we're working with people who already have similar projects uh, running locally. For example, in Australia, there's a desert fireball network. And they're doing an amazing job of recovering meteorites as best as they can as in Western Australia, for example. Um, but um, they lack coverage in Victoria and other parts of Australia. And they have a really good group, really good scientists. And we want to make sure that if meteorites are found, that they go to the right place. Um, but meteorite hunting can be really tricky because uh, local laws can differ significantly. And for example, in a lot of countries, it's so, um, I think here in Canada, if you find it on public land, here it's called crown land, um, you can keep the meteorite, but otherwise it belongs to the person who owns the land. But in some areas, you can actually purchase mineral rights, and then the meteorite is yours, regardless of who owns the land. It, it, it can be very complicated. In some countries, um, I think someone mentioned in the chat in the previous session, where when you find the meteorite, you have to, to hand it over to the government. Uh, and there are many, many different, even I would say, smart laws. So for example, um, there's, a, there's a law in most uh, ex-Soviet countries it's a very, very smart law. There was the person who was writing the law was probably a physicist or something. And it states that basically a meteorite becomes the property of the state the moment it reaches the velocity of zero, which basically means it crashes through a house, through a roof, destroys something. That's not the state's problem, but the moment it stops, then it's theirs, right? So you really have to understand the local laws before you engage in this. And the best way to do it is just talk to the professionals, right? Um, but yeah, it can be, it can be a problem. Um, 
Okay. Uh, any other questions related to Pete's talk or uh, just a quick follow up? I know in the state of New Mexico, we have uh, Native American lands for a number of pueblos. We have the Navajo Nation lands. Uh, we have Bureau of Land Management. We have Forest Service lands, which are federal properties. We have all kinds of different land status. And certainly you really don't want to encourage people to go stomping around on lands that are part of say the Navajo Nation, um, or as I would imagine, First Nation lands in Canada would be another sensitive issue. So you have to respect land ownership issues and somebody flying into town and renting a Jeep, you, there's just no way to know what they're gonna do. And you may wind up with a bad press because of it. So it's, it's really, a, it's, it's a bit of a difficult situation. Proceed with caution. There's a definite space rock craziness. And sometimes we would uh, work with people who recovered the meteorite who were trying to you know, convince them to hand it over for analysis because they're, they're holding like an invaluable thing that can help us find new things about uh, the solar system. And um, you know, we have to be first to talk to those people and it shouldn't be someone who's just offering their money or trying to scam them out of a meteorite or something. Right. And it happens. It happens a lot if people don't know what they have. Um, and that's why it's, it's kind of very important to be maybe kind of a bit secretive about it. But yeah, it's um, OK. So officially, we have a break for uh, a few more minutes. But perhaps we I see that we have a few new people uh, in our meeting. So I would invite them to just introduce themselves very shortly. So um, so we know who, who they are. If they're up for it. So if you want to introduce yourself, just kind of raise your hand and, uh, and let me know. We did a round of introductions at the beginning of the meeting, but I guess uh, they're either shy or they're away for the break, but that's fine. Anytime you guys want to do it or not, no problem. Uh, but yeah, um, so we're going to continue with Bill Wallace in about three minutes, two minutes. I'm going to step away for those two minutes. Okay, Bill, we're back on schedule, so please go ahead. We can oh, see your slides. I seem to make it go backwards. You just see the first slide and some a window with some options, but my first slide is won't go back. Hmm. 
Oh, okay. It's <laughs> okay. I'm Bill Wallace. Uh, I've worked in concert with Steve, uh, Pete, and Steve. I have Steve's camera, and I have my own computer. And as a lark, I decided to find out if I can duplicate what already exists in uh, RMS. But when I started this, I didn't know anything about the structure of FITS files, so I could only see the max pixel. And so I chose to use consecutive FITS files because not much is going to change in 10 plus seconds, except things that move. With these two frames, I divide the, the 1280 by 720 pixel into 40 by 40 pixel windows. I slide the windows eight uh, pixel increments in the vertical and horizontal direction. I count the pixel above a minimum brightness in each window. Count, if the count is high enough, I perform a correlation, computer correlation factor in X and Y domain. And then if that exceeds 0.85, I perform a linear regression. I'm just looking for straight lines. And I report out the slope and intercept. And then I cluster these, you know, there's maybe four or 500 of these things. And if they have match up, I, I cluster them into the minimum number of reports. I use CFITS.io from NASA. The languages I use are C, C++ for analysis and TCLTK for displays. I have my Python skills are way inferior to the, the skills I have in these languages. Uh, I moved from a Pi 3 to a Pi 4 and then went into a, a Intel uh, uh, sort of a mini computer. It's about 11 times faster than the Pi 4. So with that excess computing power, I decided I could try to do this particular project. Uh, as I, I built up a array of tools and I put them in a, something I can just run at any given time. I can track stars, I can track meters in the version one of my software then, or version two. I can actually put this in a, basically semi real time tracking. It runs about one and a half frames behind. I mean, fits files behind. I can then check uh, the tracks with a process where I can match up the tracks with the pictures I have in the, the fits files I have in the, in the uh, caption directory and I can make J, JPEGs whenever I want. This is a, as I asked, I'm in a meteor that was not detected by, let's see, I did this on for February 12th and the target time here is 092833 this particular meter was not was not detected by rms so i run with version 1 which was written in c i had to do all the clustering in tickle so i have four tracks that are landed on top of each other there. When I went to version two, I took, put the clustering 
did the C++. I moved my algorithm into from C to C++ and added the clustering. And but it shows that I don't have any idea what direction it's going because I didn't learn about max frame at all until just a couple of weeks ago. And this is the a two frame stack uh, with the I have collected 90, over 90 evenings of data. This one happened to be, I saved the data from this time. It's August 14th. And I think that was end of the Perseids, if someone knows for sure. I counted uh, 414, 292 by RMS. I detect, detected 411 of them, and there was 289 that both of them detected. And there was plenty of satellites, plenty of planes. I, that's a little bit high on the satellites, but uh, about right on the planes. The false positives were counted. I have UFO data is stuff that I just cannot tell what's what. I don't try to, I try not to make up data. And then I counted the, the data. Uh, it was interfered by clouds, and I got 93 meters and that, 27 satellites and 11 planes. And then I, lately, I added this meteors by hour UTC. We usually start anywhere from in, this, in the winter time. It's about Zero, 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 40 something, and we go back almost to two o'clock in the summertime. This is the report from the, the night of the example, where there were, I caught four, 54, and uh, RMS only got 23. Two false positives. False uh, RMS false positive is that there's a FITS file that says there's supposed to be something there and there's not a meter in it. That's the only criteria. False positives from my software or anything that I just say is, I don't know. I just, it's blank. It just has. Something I know, or there's a, it says two stars at the end of it. Two minutes. Uh, this is the summary for not 90 nights. In 90 nights, I got 10,000 meteors. RMS got 5,700. And so I'm detecting, uh, RMS detects 54% with respect to the total. I get 90, almost 99% and I get 98% of what RMS does. Uh, this particular area is suggestive of a conclusion that I arrived at. So that's an unasked question. I mean, while I do quote unquote real time analysis, I gotta discriminate between the planes and the and the satellites and the meteors later. And there are a lot more meteors up there to be detected. And uh, the answer to the unasked question is, what's the best direction to point a camera? And I say generally east. My Cameras pointed almost north, yet over 75% of my uh, detections are after local midnight. 
questions? Awesome. Thanks, Bill. Um, any questions for Bill? Uh, Kurt, go ahead. Just to confirm, you manually went through and you got 10,000 detections and and that's how you're comparing and getting the accuracy rate of your algorithm? Yes. Okay. It turns out that uh, when you see a one detected by RMS has a pretty good signature of only being in one frame. Sometimes it's in two, but more often than not, it's in one. So when I go through and see something that looks like a meteor that's not detected, I make sure that it's not in the frame before and the frame after. Mm -hmm. If I see it in the frame before or two or the frame after, I label it a satellite, unless it's a plane. But the planes are pretty obvious. They're, they're big, wide lines with bumps out of the side. Mm -hmm. It'd be really interesting to see the, the meteors that uh, get missed because RMS applies a set of filters to detections. And yes, yeah, first of them, the angular velocity, which you already included. Um, and second of all, is a minimum of four frames because if they're detected on less, we cannot measure the velocity of the meteor, just purely yeah. from like, you know, when you do it uh, theoretically. Um, so yeah, it would be a really good comparison because if we are to compute very accurate uh, fluxes of meteor showers, we want to make sure that we know what our efficiency is. And that's something yeah. that, will, that will have to be uh, quantified. Uh, however, from yeah. some, I guess some past investigations, we didn't find any any big drops. It'd be really good to understand exactly what kinds and types of me uh, meteors are uh, are lost. Uh, are they mostly just faint, or they have some specific? Well, I've been paying attention to the the plot that shows the was it the plot of the uh, field subs. Mm -hmm. And that's all that's kind of an indication of what the limiting magnitude of the sky is. And there's a region, you know, like sometimes I see one that, oh, that RMS should have got this one, and it didn't. Uh, I'm guessing that. It, the sky was just a bit uh, had, a, had too much. The, the field sums are too high. That's my guess. Mm -hmm. I haven't. Uh, Pete and I are going. Uh, I'm going to wait until um, uh, there's a new moon and two clear nights in a row. And Pete's going to send me these plots, and I'm going to determine. Who has the best chance of uh, not missing them? Because really dark places shouldn't. And I'm I'm uh, below average in 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 that. Mm -hmm. uh, some places are much brighter than mine. Okay. Uh, well, thank you very much, Bill, for your talk. Uh, next up is Derek, who's going to tell us about um, a big fireball that his camera recorded. So, Derek, please go ahead. Uh, yep, I'll just see if I can share the screen. Uh, is everyone seeing that? Looks good. Okay. Um, all right, so I'm just going to go back one image. So um, just move you guys over. Um, yeah, so um, this is about a fireball we recorded in November last year. I'd just like to acknowledge Dennis and Martin Towner, who did the dark flight projection and Andy Tonkins from Monash University that um, led the ground search. Um, so this is what created the initial excitement. Um, so these are the images of the of the two FITS um, files. Um, and you can see that it went over, the fireball went over two, it's just the initial one. And then there was a, an outburst and a brighter section here. You can see a, a reflection there in the screen. So that's what created the excitement. Um, and uh, we, we had, um, uh, Dennis contact me, he'd obviously seen it, and, and 
And I was really interested to see if I could develop a video uh, of this. And I had a lot of help from, from people in the, um, uh, on the forum. And, uh, and with a bit of help, I was able to um, uh, get the two GIF files from the two frames, import them into Movavi, uh, which is the program that I use for videos, and then produce these uh, really nice video. And I also put it onto, onto YouTube. I'm going to play that again because it's just so nice. And I was just, I was absolutely gobsmacked when I produced this to see this is about 150 kilometres away. And to see that bolloid just moving through the atmosphere there and, and the amount of detail you can see in that, you know, an object that's 150 kilometres away, I was just absolutely staggered. So, um, uh, so Dennis said, oh, there'll be people looking, looking for rocks. Um, uh, so, uh, and I thought, well, we've got to do something about this to see if we can recover some, uh, uh, some meteorites. So, um, so just to give you an idea of, I'm sitting here in Shepparton, or in Marupna actually, which is on the outskirts of Shepparton. So I'm sitting here, uh, just for, a, this is Sydney up here, Melbourne down there, and the town of Bendigo, which is a fairly large town, is in here. So the dark flight strewn field is just to the west of Bendigo in that area here. So, uh, so I'm observing with my camera here. And there was another camera in Melbourne. We've since got another camera in Murchison, but we were about a week away from putting that up, so which has been unfortunate. Um, and we had a, we had a very busy week after uh, after we saw this. Um, Dennis said, "Well, we just missed the tail of the meteorite. Can you get some? See if you can get some uh, CCTV footage." So I was racing around. Uh, um seeing if i could get cctv footage to get the end of the tail we weren't successful um uh, and uh i was trying to contact people i said well we've got to get a ground search up see if we can find uh, any rocks on the ground um the people at curtain were in lockdown still uh i contacted andy Cleedlow from melbourne university and the melbourne museum they were very interested but they didn't have any resources so it looked as though I was going to go and make a search on my own for this uh, for these meteorite fragments. Um, and Dennis and Mountain uh, Martin had come up with quite a nice plan of the strewn zone and the dark flight. Uh, and Dennis can tell you more about this, but I but uh, it's based the location of where the rock is likely to land. Uh, is based on the the estimated size of the uh, of the fragments. So from one kilogram, five hundred kilograms, hundred fifty kilograms, and ten kilograms. So um, um, so and with, and the advice was it's most likely to be in this uh, this area here. Hundred to fifty kilograms is the likely size of the meteorite if it's 10, 10 grams you're probably not going to find them anyway um it's actually an area i know very well i was married in this on the golf course just here i've been to the i've been to the great stupa quite well and there's an allies road along here which i go along quite frequently. so i know i knew the area very well um so um so and it looked as i was going to do a search on my own i developed a little uh leaflet to hand out to uh, the residents which i'll show you um, but on the Friday night, uh, I had a call as a guy from uh, um, Hadrian, um, I assume connected with the Desert Firewall Network, put me in contact with Martin, um, uh, sorry, Andy Tompkins, uh, Monash University, has a lot of experience in, uh, in, fire, in uh, meteorite searches in the Nullarbor. Uh, and they were able to, so we had a bit of a talk with them and they were able to ascend, assemble a team uh, to come out on the following Monday. And they had a student, um, uh, Angus, that was based in Bendigo at the time. And we agreed to meet uh, on the Sunday. I had to be there for another reason to, uh, to go and have a look at the area and to contact residents. So, and we were quite lucky, the first residence we contacted was in here somewhere. 
Uh, and it was a guy that basically owned all of this property and he owned another property uh, up in here somewhere. And he's also, he had a, a daughter that lived just in here who was a um, science teacher and was very helpful and cooperative. So we got an immediate uh, response and, um, uh, and uh, cooperation from the local residents. We were acting on Dennis's advice not to talk to the media. So we didn't talk to the media at this stage. So this is the leaflet that I put together. So, um, so this is only handed out to, uh, to residents. Have you seen any strange rocks? Um, uh, so there's a, an image of the, of, the strewn, of, the, of the strewn zones and examples of meteorites. I'd put the, I'd put the, uh, the video on YouTube by this stage. So there was a YouTube link and a few uh, frequently asked questions. I had a bit of an idea. I'd actually sat in on the Winchcombe meteorite, the BAA um, uh, video um, a few weeks before that. And so I had a bit of an idea as to what you should do with a, uh, with a search and how you should go about it. So a lot of that is sort of taken from uh, the Winchcombe experience. Um, so um, anyway, so we contacted the um, uh, the residents and uh, and then on the Monday uh, immediately afterwards uh, this is uh, oh, oh, my video is skipping around here this is Andy this is Andy Tompkins here and he assembled a team of students and uh, and scientists all had a lot of experience in doing previous searches to um, uh, to have a look for the meteorite fragments um, so there we are you can see it's um, on the ground, you can see it's quite difficult terrain. It's long grass, uh, quite difficult to see anything on the ground. But I, but you would have, we would have seen it uh, if there were media fragments there. We think we would have, we would have picked them up. But quite difficult country to walk over, and and to see anything. Um, so, uh, so then, so on the Monday, we, we the Monday morning, we basically. Uh, search this area here um, and then in the afternoon we split up into two groups. I'd contacted two residents uh, that own property in this area which is actually an easier walking easy area and sort of right in the middle. This lady, it was a lady here had said she'd heard something on the on the roof one night so I thought, well, that sounds a bit promising and um, Andy and his team was a larger group uh, moved across to this area here and did a search in that, in, in that area. So you can see we've actually covered quite a large area of the strewn zone. Um, Andy had another map that had been produced from, um, uh, from the people at Curtin, which suggested there might have been some drift uh, a little bit further to the north and west, but anyway. Uh, we, we got a pretty good coverage, we think. Um, so found nothing. Uh, so um, so despite all the advice from, from Dennis while I was asking about, uh, about meteorite hunters, uh, we thought uh, we'd found nothing on the ground. The best chance of actually finding something was actually to go out and, uh, and uh, do some radio interviews and take people into our competence. We didn't show them the strewn zone. Um, so I did a radio interview with a colleague in uh, ABC Shepparton, and that was also uh, publicised in Bendigo, I went to her in Bendigo, and the ABC also did a feature article. Um, so um, um, so that's, the, that's a copy of the feature article from, from ABC there. So I... I'm in two minds about this because I know at Winchcombe, you know, they, they were lucky enough to find a meteorite in someone's driveway and they only found that because there had been a publicity campaign and, uh, and somebody reported finding this strange rock in there. So that's um, interesting how much coverage you should do. So that's a question. So, um, um, so what are the positives out of this, all this? So, um, well, we're... I, out of this, we made some fantastic connections, of course. I, you know, I got to meet Andy and his team. Um, sorry, I'll just move that again. Um, and uh, we'll be much better prepared. Having met Andy and known his team, he's, he's prepared to do searches in the, in the future. They've done a, a couple of searches in, uh, in, the, in the Nullarbor and not found very much. So somewhere in Victoria is much easier for them. 
Um, we had fantastic collaboration from Astronomical Society of Victoria, and that's that is continuing. They're now uh, they have a budget to put up some more global meteor network uh, cameras, uh, and um, so we're going to see a. a, a an exponential increase in meteor cameras in, in Victoria and hopefully right across southern southern Australia. Uh, and it was excellent promotion for the global meteor network. You know, the fact, you know, that we were going out there with a lot of um, promotion of the global meteor network on radio, etc. Uh, it was a good dry run. Next the next time this happens, we'll be much better prepared. I'll know who to talk to and uh, and what to do and where to go. Um, so that's so there were a lot of a lot of good news out of all that. The negatives, we didn't find any rocks, but we tried. <laughs> awesome. So Thank you. Uh, yeah, one thing to, to mention is that uh, unfortunately the end of the fireball wasn't recorded. It just went just ever so slightly outside of the field of view, and that really hampered the, the the success of finding anything because we had to estimate where it ended, and that just made the stream feel very very long. Um, okay, are there any questions for Derek? Okay, um, I don't see any hands up, but if there are any more questions about meteorites, we can definitely discuss them during our uh, Q and A. And the final talk of the uh, the final talk of the meeting uh, is going to be a recording. Uh, it was sent by Gene Ross, and the recording is about his work on optimizing uh, camera pointings for maximizing the, um, the the overlap in the atmosphere. So let me just very quickly set this up, and I'm going to play it for a few seconds, and you please let me know if if everything's okay or not. Um, I just want to make sure that you hear the audio well. So I'm going to share my sound and optimize for video. Good morning, or good afternoon, or good evening, depending on the time in which you're watching this. My name is Jane Moraz, and today I'll be. Okay, just a short question. Uh, does everything sound good here? Can you hear him well? Yes. OK, great. Thanks. I'm going to continue playing. Talking about optimizing camera pointing. This map of meteor observations for January 2022 shows the current state of coverage in southwestern US. The three regional networks, the New Mexico Meteor Array, the Lowell Observatories Network and the Southern California Network are visible in this figure. On the right here, on the right here, we see the coverage of the New Mexico Meteor Array. In the middle is the coverage of the Lowell Observatory Network. And on the left here is the coverage of the Southern California network. Our goal is to improve the mesh of the New Mexico and Southern California networks to the Eastern and Western edges of the Lowell network. To do this, we have created a numerical model for optimizing camera pointing for meter detection. More specifically, the model seeks to find the optimal orientation for each camera in the network that maximizes the volume of atmosphere that can be held within the field of view of at least three cameras. I started this work about a year ago after the first workshop, and I published a paper in eMedia News in November that describes that work. It was predicated on a field of view that can be described as an 88 degree sector of a circle in the horizontal plane and a 44 degree sector of a circle in the vertical plane. This approach had an obvious shortcoming as can be seen here. The sector model is shown in red and the uh, uh, field of view from the plate par file is shown in blue. And it's clear that the sector model clearly misses the meteors that are out on the wings 
uh, as detected by the camera view, as detected by the camera, and shown uh, in the field of view, as shown in the field of view of the plate part derived from the plate plug file. So, in the second version of the optimization model, we changed, uh, made a significant change to the model of the field of view. And now we have the, we, the field of view model is derived from what I call a standard reference field of view polygon. This was provided to me by Dennis Bida. He provided with me two polygons, one at a central elevation angle of 35 degrees, and a second one at a central elevation angle of 45 degrees, projected at 100 kilometers elevation altitude with no rotation. I took these two polygons, I transformed them to eight different azimuths and projected them at six different altitude levels between 70 and 120 kilometers. So the model has available for each camera that it is optimizing, it has 16 different orientations to choose from. The model domain is approximately 1,000 by 1,000 kilometers in the horizontal dimension and 60 kilometers high in the vertical dimension. It is a three-dimensional Cartesian grid with 10 kilometers resolution in all directions. The model has a couple of additional features. The field of view of any camera can be masked for local obstruction. So if we know that a given camera has an obstruction in the field of view at a given azimuth, then that can be incorporated into the field of view model and the um, code uh, treats it accordingly. The field of view is also restricted to elevation angles where a light extinction due to atmospheric scattering is estimated to be less than one magnitude. This is a function of the height of the station above sea level. And so, for example, at zero kilometers of, at sea level, the low angle cutoff is at 16 degrees above the horizon, whereas at a high station at, say, three kilometers above sea level, the low angle cutoff is at seven degrees above the uh, horizon. The data for this estimate was taken from a paper by Daniel Green in 1992 in the International Comet Quarterly that he wrote for estimating uh, total visual magnitude of comets from of comets at low elevation angles. The model also avoids solutions that yield overlapping azimuths for co-located cameras. This turned out to be a problem in the first version of the model and one that I was able to correct in the second version. The code itself, the optimization code itself, is uh, conducted by a what's, what is known as a mixed integer linear programming process that is freely available on the SAS software platform. Model and code development was performed on the seven cameras in the Southern California network, where we seek to improve the mesh of the those cameras with the field of view of the existing network, the western edge of the existing network of the over 30 stations in Arizona that is operated by the Lowell Observatory and a few privately operated cameras. In this case, we have two pairs of co-located cameras 0S and 1R are operated by Bob Massey at a single location. 0V and 1Q are operated by Alex McConaughey at a single location. And the remaining three cameras are single cameras operated by Robert McCoy, uh, by Larry Groom in St. George, Utah, and Rob Steele uh, near Los Angeles. So these are the results of our first model run. This shows a projection of the coverage at 100 kilometers by all the cameras in the Southern California and Arizona networks. The Lowell cameras, the Arizona cameras are shown here in gray. 
and the Southern California networks are shown in various colors. Two, the two co-located cameras, 0S and 1R, the model chooses to point one of those cameras to the north and one camera to the south. The two co-located cameras, 0V and 1Q, one is oriented to the east, and one is oriented to the south. Now, this south-facing camera is interesting because it shows the effects of an obstruction in the field of view. So if we look at the perimeter of the field of view of this camera, we see that there's a little bit of a notch cut out here, which represents the loss of, loss of range due to the existence of an obstruction in the field of view southeast of that camera location. Looking towards the north, so you can see here, well, let's go back to the south. You can see here that we have three camera coverage to this region from 0, uh, one, uh, 0, 1R, 0, 1Q, and in green here, we have the coverage afforded by station 1E, giving us three camera coverage down here. Looking to the north, we have three camera coverage also provided by Station 0S in blue, Station 0U from Utah in yellow, and Station 27 to the northeast from Los Angeles area in, as shown in purple. Now here too, we can see the effects of atmospheric extinction on the shape of the field of view. So for example, Station 0S is that 0.9 kilometers above sea level, and if the shape of its perimeter of its field of view goes about like this, but station 27 is at 1.6 kilometers above sea level, and the shape of the perimeter of its field of view looks quite a bit different, it goes about like this. So we can see in this plot, in this figure, the outcome of the optimization model, and it shows how we, how it gives us a nice mesh with the western edge of the Lowell network. It demonstrates how the model accommodates a obstruction in the field of view, and also shows how the model accommodates uh, atmospheric extinction due to scattering. So our goals for the remainder of this year are to map out all of the local obstructions that exist, may exist for all seven cameras in the Southern California network. And then we'll produce a final recommendation for reorienting those cameras. Once we complete that, we intend to scale up the model for optimization of the now 24 cameras that are in the New Mexico media array with the Eastern edge of the Lowell Network. Thanks for your attention. And if you have any questions or comments on this work, I'd be happy to discuss them with you. You can reach, send them to me at this email address down here at the bottom of the page. Uh, I am uh, happy to talk to anybody about these uh, issues. And thank you for your attention and hope you're having a great meeting right now. Okay, so that was uh, Gene's talk. Um, now, I understand that if there are any questions, Pete Eshman might answer them, uh, even though, um, yeah, so uh, any questions for Gene slash Pete? David, go ahead. Hi, how easy would it be to take this software tool that you've got or modeling technique and deploy it somewhere else? Okay, that's a very good question. The, the software that Gene is using is SAS. Uh, there's a free uh, university edition available of that product. It's a very high-end statistical package uh, costing thousands of dollars a year if you were to try to buy it. However, what Gene's using is a set of SAS routines with a certain set of options that he's chosen, and he runs an input data set uh, as he said, he's 
thinking about scaling it up to deal with 23 cameras, uh, he's run into some resource limitations with that. But at a minimum, the kind of information that would be needed would be lat long, elevation, field of view, uh, camera out as essentially. And those are all lines that could be extracted out of a plate bar file for the most part. And then also horizon pictures to identify um, any obstructions. So it might be feasible to port this and uh, be able to make it a little bit more widely available. But this is probably something that would be a year or two out at this point. For, you know, he's sort of trying to make sure he's got a good handle on, on this. He's been evolving his techniques with it over the last year or so and scaling it up to much bigger networks uh, could be a resource problem. Uh, so um, I don't know, did that answer any of your question? Yeah, that was a great answer. Thank you very much. Okay. So yeah. some, someday soon, it'd be great. But right now, it's kind of a underdevelopment would be one way to look at it. Now, I believe if someone is able to provide that information, that Gene would be able to run the optimization method for them, right? Okay, yeah, that's good. I, so I believe that's true. I don't know that he's asking people to send in data at this point. Uh, okay. As he indicated, his next task will be to try to deal with the New Mexico stations. He started with California because it was a relatively limited number of stations, mm -hmm. and thus it was easier to to work on developing the algorithm. Mm. Yeah, as far as I know, Gene is the first person ever to come up with some sort of an automated way to optimize pointing directions, which, which is absolutely amazing. And that's something we should definitely deploy for, for planning other, uh, other local networks. Um, I see that Derek has uh, another question. Derek, please go ahead. Um, yeah, I just, um, this is my preempt uh, part of the Q and A, but I just wonder in Victoria, where we're starting pretty much with a blank canvas, uh, does it also lend itself to looking at where you should locate cameras uh, within a given area? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. Um, so in terms of camera placement, from our experience is that we are not looking for locations and then installing the cameras, it's more like, what is who can already host a camera and then go from there so uh from i, I guess at this point almost uh, 15 years of some sort of uh, media experience we found that it's much better to have a camera in not ideal conditions that's running every day instead of a camera that's in you know perfect conditions but is broken for six months and no one can go there to fix it um so just choose your locations where there are people who can maintain the cameras that's my uh that's my uh, advice and then we can work with the pointing directions one thing that was touched on earlier um is that in some rural areas certainly in the u.s uh, there's not very good internet available availability mm. i know one of our westernmost cameras the gentleman has two cameras. He's only been able to host one because his internet's so bad. And so that is that is a real problem. Uh, is when you when you talk about an ideal location would be point X, but there's no internet there. Or as Dennis suggests, uh, who's going to take care of it once it's there? I mean, you might own the camera. Maybe you're looking for a host for the camera. Uh, which is a situation here where we are overdetermined in the Albuquerque metro area. We really should move some of these cameras out the ways. Um, it doesn't hurt to have be overdetermined from the standpoint of uh, what if one camera fails that night, then you've got a backup with another camera. But beyond a certain point, it gets overdetermined. Um, and in the text that uh, Tim, who's in that remote area, did just share with us that his, uh, he's got a one meg upload max for his Kemato area. So that, that, that can be a real concern. Um, 
Thanks, Pete. Um, I suggest that we take a very short five minute break and then come back for the final part of the meeting, which is going to be our unstructured workshop slash QA, where you can ask all the questions that you want and it can really be hands on and just pure discussion like uh, we did in the, the first the session. Okay, so see you all in five minutes. Hi Hamish, can you hear me? I can hear you. <laughs> okay, we just switched off. We just muted ourselves. Yes, yeah, sorry, I missed almost all of the meeting. It was uh, too early in the morning for me here in New Zealand, and uh, and then we went fishing. <laughs> well, it's it's all been recorded, and it'll be available on YouTube, so you can always watch it at your at your leisure. Oh, very good. Six thousand of YouTube. <laughs> okay. Oh, well. No, that's good. I hope everyone had a good time, and there was some good uh, uh, interaction. Hamish, your camera is still off. It's still off the air, I believe. Uh, I think my video is on. Yes. Well, you're in time for the, the Q and A session, so. Uh, but I know, for instance, last year's conference, Dennis did a great job. He had on the YouTube section, uh, he had bookmarks for each talk. So you didn't just have to go from beginning to end. You could, you know, hit certain talks one time and go back and catch others other times. So hopefully I'll do something similar this time. Uh, I've got a quick question for Hamish. Are, are you NZ0001? Yeah. Right. <laughs> That's good. Nice to meet you. First on the first on the on the list. <laughs> and I'm NZ004. Oh all right. You're down where you're down in Dunedin, are you, Peter? Or no Martinborough. Martinborough. Where's Martinborough? It's East of you. Oh, Martinborough, I think. And in I'm NZ003. Blenheim or across the strait? Across the strait. It's in Martinborough's oh, on the oh. south south of the wire wrapper. Right, right, right. Yeah. Is there only one down there? Or is there anyone else? Yep, NZ. Oh, yeah. Where are you, Bob? In the cargo. In the cargo last night, yeah. I have a spare camera. Um, it's not fully configured yet, but I have all the parts. So, um, I don't know. Pete, is yours pointing across the Cook Strait or towards the north or something? Northeast. Would it, would you have? 
bad light pollution if you were to point on east? <laughs> you mean from, only from the moon? And... Oh, gee whiz, what's that noise? Sorry, that was a clock. <laughs> um, yeah, anyway. We, we can do this offline. Yeah, indeed. No, it's really good to see that uh, the discussion started. So, uh, yeah, we have some new people here. Uh, who wants to introduce themselves, please? Well, we, we want to know who you are. Well, I guess I've been talking, so I might as well. I'm Hamish. Um, yeah, I was New Zealand 001 or 0001. Is it 0001 or 001? Anyway. Um, yeah, so in Nelson, uh, there's myself and uh, Jeremy over in Mochuaca, about 50 kilometres to the east. We have an overlapping um, view, so we do a little bit of triangulation. I'm not sure how good our data quality is, but um, we don't seem to get terribly many um, triangulations, um, but anyway. Not that many, but there's room to grow. Okay, uh, do we have yeah. um, anyone else who joined us recently who wants to just very quickly introduce themselves? Um, I'm trying to look through the list, maybe. <clears throat> well, if not, uh, we can continue with, uh, with our meeting. So this is the last part of the second session. Um, and this is our Q&A slash unstructured workshop where uh, we can really talk about anything from hardware, software, uh, strategic planning of the network to if you're interested in some scientific details about anything, really anything, uh, anything of interest. So uh, perhaps we, we can kick this session off with some uh, questions that uh, Derek Poulton asked, and then we can just kind of go from there. So I, I see Derek that you already have your hand up. So uh, do you want to say something? Yeah. Uh... Go ahead. I'll just ask a question with, uh, good to meet C. Hamish, by the way. It was very helpful when I was setting setting up a few months ago. Um, um, I, I assume there's a camera down in Melbourne. I don't know who owns it, but it's offline at the moment. Is there a privacy issue about about disclosing other camera operators? Uh, uh, and, yeah. Yeah, so when someone reaches out and says, oh, I want to come in contact with that person, I contact that person and I say, oh, there's someone who has another camera and wants to get in touch with you and then just leave them the contact information. And I leave it up to them if they want to get in touch or not. Uh, but as far as I understand, the person who is running the camera might be um, a, a professional who might not really maybe get involved on too 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 high a level that's at least my my understanding it is what it is um yeah, okay okay uh pete pete graham you wanted to say something uh well i am i am i on yes uh i was just saying that there's a general problem i'm east of hamish and jeremy um, I'm looking north, they're looking south, and New Zealand's have got a particular geography which is very north-south orientated. Mm -hmm. So for um, meteorite um, tracking, there's not a lot of options east-west. They're all more likely to be north-south, but I, it's, so it's a question of scale, I guess, um, which is the best way to orientate any particular camera? Is it to go up and down the landmass? Yeah, I mean, so yeah, that's a great question. So it really depends what directions are available. And if you have any directions, then it really depends on the location of the second camera. And if that's not a problem, then it depends where you want to do. So if you're interested in recovering meteorites, well, definitely you want to be looking over land instead of over sea. Um, however, yeah, I mean, these are the constraints. Uh, we really have to know the actual locations, and then we can uh, we can go from there. For example, and um, um, I think Hamish Hamish's camera and Jeremy's camera they're just very close together, only fifty kilometers apart. So the only uh, viewing directions they they have to both look like this, and I think they're they're looking. Are they looking inland or overseas? I don't remember uh, exactly, but these are the limitations and once you know inland, inland excellent uh, and once you have those constraints then then you can go from there 
Um, but I see a couple of hands up from uh, uh, David. David has his hand up. David, go ahead. Can you tell us a bit about the difference between the Desert Fireball Network and the Global Media Network? Because I, I, from what I understand, the two networks do complement each other rather than compete. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, so the Desert Fireball Network, their goal is to recover as many meteorites as possible to observe meteorites in the atmosphere uh, and the way their uh, expansion worked is that they were they contacted institutions universities museums etc cetera, etc cetera, and those institutions then host the cameras um, their cameras are all sky however their sensitivity is much uh much less sensitive so they only observe big fireballs that happen very rarely uh, and uh their goal is just basically meteorite recovery and western australia is probably one of the best places in the world to do this because you have this orange soil that's devoid of almost any vegetation and when a black rock falls it's really easy to, easy to spot Right. Um, and the DFN is also active in other uh, countries in the world. We also have a, a network here uh, in Canada. And in fact, my group operates some DFN cameras for some of our work. In fact, the way my research group operates is we just get everything that we can get our hands on and we install it and see how it performs and, uh, and test it just for comparison and, of course, for, uh, for learning. So the way it works with the Desert Fireball Network in Australia is that uh, they are established and usually from, I guess, you know, my perspective, I contact them and say, hey, there's a group of people, of amateur astronomers installing cameras in uh, your region. And I told them anytime a fireball happens, if you need something, you know, we'll contact people, we'll make sure the data is available, anything that you need to make sure that that meteorite is recovered so from you know our perspective we don't really want to compete with anyone uh locally because we i mean we can't they have uh, networks of people they have resources and we are here to support scientific efforts that are already in place if they do not exist then the gmn is the primary uh primary network uh in that area that's basically the idea. Uh, we don't want to take anyone's work. We just want to enhance collaboration because there are things that the GMN can do in terms of data quality and precision that others cannot. And it's nicer to have 10 people on the paper than five and to actually increase the quality of the scientific publication. And of course, to, to connect amateur astronomers and professionals and really put um, you know, make sure that if you're running a, a camera, that that data is useful and you're actually making a good contribution instead of just, you know, producing pretty pictures. Um, I see a few more hands up. So, uh, David, I guess you can go again. Can I just make a comment, Dennis? Uh, I, from a Victorian perspective, um, when I spoke to Andy Tompkins, he's got two DFN cameras that he's basically got available to deploy, but we're also looking to deploy increase the coverage of GMN, uh, RMS cameras, GMN network. So, mm -hmm. I, you know, I, I don't, I have no knowledge, you know, so do you try and deploy both or you deploy them together or what, what do you do? I mean, whatever you can do. So, uh, so because we have the experience here of, of, of running almost every single available fireball network and software or anything media related, uh, we can directly compare what they do. And we found that in fact, having more cameras is better than having less cameras. So if you can deploy them, that's great. Uh, and they're not hard to run. Uh, the DFN cameras are more or less automated. And if there's a problem, uh, people can remotely connect and fix any issues. Uh, but the, the again, the, the major problem of, of how some other firewall networks install their cameras is they go for institutions. And especially during COVID, like a lot of cameras were down simply because they were on a museum somewhere or at the university and no one was even allowed to go in. Or for example, uh, I know some issues where they installed the camera at a roof of, a, of an apartment building of a university and something breaks, the only person who can go to the roof is the janitor. Oh, the janitor is on a holiday or on a leave. No one can get there, blah, blah, blah. So 
it's much easier when it's your your home something happens i send you an email you go out you know look out the window oh yep done fixed and this is why we're so successful is because we just kind of don't have any of the red tape the bureaucracy that other people have to go through we just don't care about that we just why, why do that at all right um i can understand from their perspective because they think that professional institutions are more serious and they can be more reliable and you know if you're giving a, a you know a twenty thousand dollar camera to someone you want to make sure that that person is not gonna i don't know sell it or wreck it or or, or whatever <laughs> Um, so yeah, it's a completely different approach. Our cameras are so cheap that it's it's almost not, not for them. It's yeah, they don't care. It's so cheap. Um, okay, I see that Steve Welch has hid, uh, his hand up for a while. So Steve, go ahead. Uh, Steve, you're muted. Okay, I'm gonna ask you to unmute. There we go. That worked. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, this is probably inappropriate, but um, Hamish, I was wondering. I have a very close friend who is a former employer that is retired and he's very interested in locating a camera. Um, and he's in uh, Nelson. Is that, that's, I think that's just more or less where you are, right? I'm in Nelson. Yeah. But I guess we could also. Have another direction, but it'd be best if we have another one. I think probably maybe sending it across to Peter if if we can work out that we can send you know aim one east uh, west towards us, and then it would be like 120 130 kilometers away. It would be probably an ideal distance. Would you say, uh, Dennis? Yeah, uh, anything between let's say 50 to 300 kilometers is great. I think if if anyway we can Pete and I can do this offline. Awesome. Okay. Any other questions or comments uh, regarding any current topics? Uh, Paul, go ahead. Yeah, um, we were buying all this uh, stuff from China. And I was wondering how is it possible that there is no interest among Chinese amateurs in this stuff? Uh, when I look at the statistics, the visitors on our uh, media news website, then the Chinese are the fourth or fifth uh, most popular visitors on the website of media news. And media news is not for general public. That means there must be dedicated amateurs interested in media. Did you ever get any feedback or contact from that side from the world? Yeah, yeah, that's actually a great question. Uh, I did. There are a f two or three cameras in China at this moment. Uh, unfortunately, they do not overlap. Uh, from what I heard with people, there is some interest. And I think in terms of building cameras there, the parts are even cheaper for them. Uh, because I, I have some friends who spent some time in China and they say, what we buy from AliExpress that has huge markups compared to the Taobao market that they have in China. It's like basically AliExpress, but for their market and everything there is like half the price. So they could very easily build these cameras, but I'm really unsure about the, the interest. And I, you know, if I was contacted, I'd very, very willingly uh, try to help to, to build the network there. Uh, Jim has his hand up. Jim, go ahead. Oh yeah, it's just, uh talking about desert fireball network cameras and GMN cameras, that if you've got a bunch of each to deploy, then um, deploying the DFN cameras in dark skies locations where you don't go very often is what they're designed for. Um, they have a 27 second exposure. And so if you've got light pollution, then um, it does interfere with the way they operate. So, and the GMN cameras obviously um, need a close supervision and an internet connection. So uh, I hope that's useful if you've got a bunch of both to deploy. Yep. Yeah, that's a good comment. Yeah, because uh, all the DFN systems that we're running here, there are in remote dark locations, but they also do require um, an internet connection, at least to transfer the data. Um, but it doesn't have to be constant. Uh, it just, I think, uploads once a day or something like that. Well, the, the Raspberry Pis, they require 
constant internet access for um, for keeping the correct time. Uh, and the GMN cameras actually have, a, sorry, the DFN cameras have a little GPS receiver that keeps very accurate time. Um, their time is accurate actually to a millisecond because of that. A similar system can be deployed with the GMN if we can timestamp uh, the, if we can take the time from like a little GPS receiver. I think you can buy it in very cheaply somewhere, but I don't think anyone is doing that. Um, okay, uh, Pete Ashman, go ahead. Okay, um, to my mind, the biggest problem we're facing right now is the shortage of Raspberry Pis. Mm -hmm. uh, I know that we can buy the Pi 400s. We've seen some of the two gig Pi 4s show up at one or two vendors are typically bundled as kits so that they can sell power supplies and cases and stuff. We've been able to get a couple. Has there been any serious consideration to trying to find a different single board computer? And would they also have the same supply chain issues that we're seeing with the Pi 4? Because I know Mr. Welsh there, you know, made, made an arrangement to let DigiKey let him know when they'd come in stock and he went, oh boy, a month from now. And then he realized that was, no, a month from now, next year. <laughs> I mean, this is way out now. <laughs> yeah, I mean, as far as I understand, the semiconductor shortage is, is really widespread. And however, Raspberry Pis can be obtained. Um, so the Istrastream guys, uh, they have their connection and they were able to very recently buy 50 Raspberry Pis. And the people they were talking to, they were... To them, 50 was such a small number, they didn't even want to talk any further, but they were able to convince them to give them 50. So if we had a huge order of 1,000, you know, I think we would be able to get our hands on, on it, I guess, through their connections. But uh, yeah, I'm not sure. As long as the other types of Raspberry Pis are available, like the 400, the price difference is not that high and it works just as well. I think we can, we can work with that. Um, I also see a uh, hand up from David. David, go ahead. Uh, just talking about the Raspberry Pi shortage, I've had great success using five, six, seven, ten year old Linux PCs, not even any desktop running seven cameras, and it's absolutely bomb proof. The only time it falls over is if it loses the power supply. And it's installed using the script developed by someone in the, in the network, and it's, it's so simple. Yeah, and they, they're available secondhand so readily. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. They can run multiple cameras. Um, and that's, yeah, that's a great alternative um, in, in, instead of Raspberry Pi. So I just want to quickly address the question of can other uh, similar boards to Raspberry Pi be used? And I really don't know. So what I can tell you that when we first started testing different boards back in 2015, 16, uh, we spent, I don't know how much money buying everything that was available on the market back then. And the Raspberry Pi was the only board at the time uh, that was stable enough to run the software that didn't have any weird issues or bugs. And also the most important thing is that it had the, the drivers that enabled the video uh, decoding to run on the GPU and not on the CPU. Uh, because the, the, the processor in these single board computers are so, well, not, they're not powerful enough to run live video decompression like on some sort of a PC-based CPU. Now, that was a long time ago. Perhaps now there are other options. If you're interested in that, please go ahead and try. And uh, if it works, I think that people are going to be very happy if they can use uh, alternative boards. Um, uh, Derek has a question. Derek, go ahead. Um, yeah, I put up a few questions, but I, one's a suggestion to sort of move the topic on a little bit, I suppose, was, um, I, you know, I had some experience putting a camera up. Mm -hmm. I just wondered whether it would be a good idea to have a debrief after somebody puts a camera up, because uh, there are, uh, and this is not, I've had fantastic support from you and Mark and others, so um but there are issues that you that you come up against 
and getting some feedback on those issues would help to maybe have a continual improvement of the wiki page and sort of help help other people along the way. Um, so that would be a suggestion. Um, and the other one we've really uh, we've sort of touched on a bit, we've, but we've got a pretty blank canvas in in uh, Victoria, and I'm just I'm wondering how we should. But I think you've already addressed that question. So um, any thoughts on a, a debrief? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, that's that's really great. Uh, so the wiki page is designed in such a way that anyone can edit it. So what what I would do is if you have suggestions that you can make and you see something you say okay you know this can be improved this can be made clear uh i can make you an account on the wiki page and yeah. go in and if you have something that you want to discuss we can discuss it on the group and say yep go ahead and uh, and make that change um because you know I, I understand that it might be hard for me to see something from uh from your perspective and then the best way for uh, other people who are starting in a network is to get direct advice from people like you who went through the process recently from the same uh, from the same perspective. Um, so that's definitely one thing that that, yeah. that we do. And I think uh, there are many improvements on the wiki page where they were made by um, uh, Pete. Pete, who, who made those improvements? Uh, was it Bob? Bob Massey, right? Bob is here. Um, he made some great additions to the wiki, and I think before the, those additions were made, he kind of created a document, and then we discussed individual items, and then he implemented them in the wiki. And I think we can we can do the same thing. I, what do you think about that? Yeah, look, I, 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 one of the things I struggled with was that there was a reference to the camera had a dedicated uh, or prescribed IP network and it doesn't, you've actually got to go and find it. So mm -hmm. they're, they're things and you wouldn't know about that because you're not installing them. So um, mm -hmm. I think that's actually quite a good process maybe to, if there are, if there are problems that I've found or Bill or others, maybe bring them back through the forum and then make it, make a change if appropriate. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, Sometimes um, different sellers uh, deliver different types of boards and things are constantly in a flux. So mm -hmm. even though it seems to be the same camera from the same seller and they can be significantly different in terms of, as you said, like the IP address and some people got uh, broken cameras and we're trying to keep up with these changes. Uh, but and sometimes there are some one offs. So, for example, I think until a couple of months ago, we didn't even hear about these IP address issues. For years, they had always did the same default IP address. So probably the best way to do it would be, again, to give you access there and say, OK, let's modify the wiki page where it says the IP address should be there. Put a little asterisk and say, recently, we started noticing that they can have a different IP address, and this is what you should do. Um, because you know, I, I would love to do it myself, but I don't have the camera board, and I don't know what you did, right? Yep. So yeah, if you want access to Wiki, um, I think you can register, and then you have to let me know what your username is, and I'm gonna uh, check you off as an editor, where you can go in and make changes. Okay. Thanks, so Dennis. Don't worry about messing something up. We can always roll the roll the changes back. So. You can't do anything wrong. Okay. Um, further questions or point of, points of discussion? So I believe uh, that Derek uh, asked a question of how to design um, um, a camera network from scratch, and when you have a blank canvas, and that's a, that's a really good question. And you know, in different countries, we had different situations and different experiences. Um, it can go from, you know, a very difficult expansion to uh, an extremely rapid exponential COVID-like expansion, which cannot be stopped or controlled like we're currently experiencing in the UK, where the number of cameras there is just so overwhelming that we just have an issue of, of keeping up with the number of new cameras. Um, so 
I think that in terms of what you can do in Victoria is first, it's good to have like a preparation of uh, just talking to people and say, oh, I'm running this media camera. This is what I get every day, like, or oh, I record a fireball. Are you interested? So I, as far as I understand, you did a lot of that prep work. You can, you connected to people in the local astronomical society. And I would recommend that that type of organic growth is the best way to do it. Uh, it it's not necessarily fast, but it's going to grow in such a rate where you can keep up. And the the co I mean, the cameras themselves are just individual points uh, and kind of geographically. But what also needs to grow with the network is this kind of community scaffolding that's going to to keep the the network running. So. For example, when we first started with the GMN, um, and um, well, probably Pete Eshman can speak more to this because he experienced a, sim a similar thing when he started his uh, network and um, the New Mexico network in, in 2018. So, so Pete, what are your thoughts about that? Um, yeah, I think that uh, I try to touch on some of these key points in, in my presentation, but basically you've got to figure out a way to make it easy to monitor more than just one or two stations. And uh, there's been, in the first session we had today, there was some discussion of maybe ways to do that uh, that would be more global in nature. But uh, what I do here is just basically try to figure out the quickest way for me to see if all the stations are up and running. Well, one way you can do that is just a little batch file on your Windows machine that pings all the stations. If they don't answer, you know, there's maybe a problem. And the next level is essentially, okay, they're there, um, but maybe they're, there's problems with their data. And that's where the error checking that we're doing, where we're, we're tallying on each station, the number of captures, the number of shortfall from expected fits counts, the fact that there's only one capture directory and there should be more, uh, basically station running out of space and all of those sorts of things in one place so that I can just go through and look at the last three lines for every one of our stations. And it'll take me five minutes to scan it and see who hasn't reported. Well, I go, okay, that's a Pi 3. That's why they haven't reported yet. Now, if I come back the next day and it still isn't reported, I go, all right, there's got to be an issue of some sort. Then I do a VNC connection into the machine and see is it if it refuses a VNC connection, I know it's offline. I try to contact the owner and get them to do what they can, reboot it, kickstart it, uh, whatever they can do to bring it back up. And then eventually we'll find that we've got a uh, a Pi 3 with a corrupted micro SD card, which is not uncommon. And so you've got to rebuild it from scratch. And it takes as much work to rebuild it from scratch as a Pi 3 as it does to build a new Pi 4 image with a Pi 4. So you've got an opportunity then to try to upgrade the hardware to something that's a bit more stable. So, so you're coordinating mostly the uh, the day-to-day -day operations of the network. Um, and one way of coordinating the network is to have a central person like Pete, who's going to be doing most of the, the, the coordination. And another way is to have kind of a decentralized system where people take care of their things. But that's, again, harder to, to organize. It really depends who, who you're working with. So if you have someone who's willing to host a camera but not participate much, then you have to be aware that you will be the one responsible for, for making that run. Um, um, so for example, we have, uh, there's a similar situation uh, in Croatia, for example, where Damir is the, the coordinator of the local network and other people are just very happy to participate and install the camera, keep it running, but there is very little further participation beyond that point. Um, so you really have to gauge the, the situation and be sure like, should I 
engaged in this or not? Or is that going to be some sort of kind of a further, um, you know, how much uh, dedicate, how, how much time I can dedicate to, um, to, to, to this project? Uh, my only suggestion is probably take it slow uh, and see what happens. Um, because when we were starting this network, uh, the software wasn't in the hardware, they weren't in a mature state where we could um, basically just uh, deploy many systems and expect them to run efficiently. And I actually was stopping the spread and telling people, no, it's not ready yet. It's not, and people, no, it's so cool. Let's do it. Like, no, no, we can't do it yet. And then only very recently it re reached a mature state where it works reasonably well uh, most of the time. Some stations still have many issues uh, because of uh, older hardware, older software, and some appear to be completely random that we can't uh, can diagnose. And however, there are some cameras that are running for three years now without a single issue ever in a remote island of La Palma and the top of a mountain and no one's been in the room where the Raspberry Pi is for two years now and seems to be running perfectly. So <laughs> it's it's completely random. Uh, so Pete, you had uh, you had something to say. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, I know that even today I'm I'm kind of torn when I we talk about public outreach and talking a lot about the meteor camera system because, um, yeah, it's a great thing. Well, if I get 50 people who want a camera, what am I going to do? I mean, I'm trying to manage my own workload to some extent. And out of all the cameras we have here, all but two or three of them were built by either Steve Welsh or myself. Or, uh, you know, we try to get build parties where we, we get people to do the hands-on assembling of the Raspberry Pi into the case to try to demystify the Raspberry Pi. But we gave them cameras that were already in the enclosures, ready to go. They had to put sealant around the glass and that sort of thing. So it's always been kind of a balancing act of the more you talk about how great it is, well, then what are you going to do? You know, how, how are you going to help these people out there? And it'd be really nice if we had a commercial supplier for meteor camera stations. Um, uh, my situation, I'm retired. I'm not looking for a job building <laughs> meteor cameras. <laughs> but it sure would be nice if we did have one. You know. Yeah, well, but, Instastream does that, but mostly just for the European market. I mean, they can send worldwide, but if you're willing to pay the shipping costs, right? Uh, in terms of someone building it in North America or other parts of the world, yeah, that's that's a good question. I, I had talks with people who um, um, uh, have something like big, um, um, people who are doing like tracking cameras and stuff like that. But for them, I think the numbers are still maybe too small and their prices would be significantly higher. So at that point, I don't think the cameras are competitive anymore. And I think that, you know, go, going the way of building your own cameras is the best in terms of kind of price to effectiveness ratio. Um, but okay, uh, Bob has a comment. Bob, go ahead. Uh, let me just ask you to unmute. How about this? Yeah. Uh, um, I got my camera built by the Croatian group mm -hmm. and I was entirely happy with it. It works no problem at all. And I hope I plan to get them to build my other, my next one. So I'm not sure how other people are using them. Yeah, so uh, the way Easter stream works is that they actually um, make the camera and they test everything and configure everything and make sure that it's going to run so people don't have any issues with it. Now, with your custom builds, the, uh, you know, some issues that can occur are um, 
uh, the power supply is probably not that good or the SD card quality is not great. And all of these things play a very significant role in the stability of the system. And it really depends, you know, what parts you can buy locally. And then that influences everything. Um, you know, I, I know when I'm always building cameras, I would just buy the SD cards at Costco. They were great. If you buy the same types of cameras on Amazon, they were garbage. So these are some things that you just kind of have to figure out on the way if, if you're making your own build. Um, Steve, Steve has a question, go ahead. Uh, let me just ask you to unmute, how about this? It used, it, it used to be I could press the space bar to talk. Can't do that anymore? I guess not. <laughs> okay. Um, I was wondering what its Insta stream cost. What is their camera cost? Uh, the Insta stream cameras, yeah. So they are, uh, I believe, 500 euros uh, now. So that's about 500 US, more or less, maybe a bit more, 550, I think. Okay, because I, I, you know, I have a camera in the Netherlands that isn't working, and I'd like to just replace it with a working camera if I could. That'd be great. Now, if they get an Insta stream camera, is it going to be configured to to talk to their server or what how does that work um yeah so what they can do is they can provide like a fully plug and play solution where you say these are the coordinates and the, we're gonna figure out the station code and everything and then uh if there is no complicated installation locally if for example there's wi-fi locally available uh and you don't have to connect it to a local network it's kind of plug and play it just connect it to the Pi, connect the Pi to the Wi-Fi, and that's it. And then after that, it just needs to be calibrated. Um, but probably, I think Paul Rogermans can, can comment on that. I think um, they were buying some cameras with maybe a more complicated installation setup, but I don't know how, well, InstaStream people are trying to be supportive as much as they can. Unfortunately, English is not their forte, so it kind of goes through me most of the time, and I can be slow. Um, I don't know, Paul, if you have any comments. Uh, yes, I bought all my cameras from uh, Istra Stream, and I'm very happy with it because I'm not a technician. So for me, all of this new technology, when I got my first camera, I know that Denis spent uh, many hours trying to solve remotely problems here. And uh, later on, the people from uh, iStream were always very helpful, just via any desk, uh, try to check what's the problem and to solve the problem. And uh, I just got a message, hey, Paul, everything is OK. Hey, I fixed the problem. It's working now. So I'm very pleased with their service. Uh, you can rely on them. OK, it's true what there is a communication. Their English is somehow limited. But uh, as long as they know how to solve a problem remotely, I'm happy with it. So uh, I'm very, very, I can recommend them. They are totally re reliable and very helpful. Good. Well, thank you, Paul. Um, so uh, I see that uh, Hamish had the question. Uh, in addition of, uh, of cameras in different parts of the world adding value uh, to the scientific in turn uh, to oh sir to the science in terms of meteor stream orbits or just in terms of falls. Well, it's both. So um, in terms of observing meteor showers, uh, the longitude sorry the hemisphere where you're located is critical because in the northern hemisphere we don't see any southern hemisphere showers at all and the other way around and also there is a question of timing uh, so we know of some meteor shower outbursts that last 15 minutes so if uh, they happen over i don't know when uh, uh, it's a day in europe or north america or whatever we just won't see them. So you need a large latitudinal coverage and large longitudinal coverage and make sure that you have both covered and that way nothing will get missed. So you know, I, I can tell you right now that there are probably meteor shower outbursts uh, in the last decade that just went completely unnoticed. Um, for example, in 2011, 
there was an outburst of the draconids that was predicted and really well observed and everyone made sure to have their cameras running and everything's fine and then in 2012 there was no prediction and it happened no one noticed for two months that it was a 10 times larger outburst it was actually like very dangerous for astronauts to be doing spacewalk at that time no one noticed uh, it was only a student here who was bored during Christmas holidays and was going back through our radar data and noticed a huge spike. And the reason why we started this network is we don't want to miss that stuff. Like that is a data point that we cannot measure again. It will never happen again. Unlike other uh, uh, other fields of astronomy, they can probably always go and observe a galaxy once more or you know an asteroid is going to return every once in a while but a meteor shower outburst it just that's it like you lost it and then if you go back and try to do your modeling and then you go back and say well you know there was supposed to be this outburst in this year but it wasn't observed so my model is wrong well no actually there were no good observations so that's that's what we're trying to tackle with uh with this uh, network just the availability of availability of data and the problem was until we started it just it was very very limited um okay uh any other questions okay uh if we don't have any further comments i think i can start addressing uh items from the list so um there is a question uh oh yeah p dashman has something p go ahead Yeah, I just wanted to follow up on the comments that have been made about uh, running multiple stations off a single Linux box. This is something I would very much like to follow up on if there are a group that can help. I know Bill Wallace has some experience with this, but uh, I would really like to move in that direction. I'm just not, it, there have been too many options put forward as to how to do it. And I'm looking for an option that would be the most straightforward, the most simple to implement. I've got a box on loan right now that I could, that's running uh, one of the uh, Linux flavors, Ubuntu 20.04. I just need some hand holding on how to really bring it up. Now, I know there's, uh, Ed Harmon has got some scripts out there. That's fine. But I'd really think it would be appropriate, especially with the difficulty in getting Raspberry Pis to put more of an official effort, well, there's nothing official here, but I mean, more of a group effort into uh, getting a good uh, plug and play kind of solution that would use a Linux box, an old Celeron, an old laptop or what have you to run say two stations and then maybe expand to three. I mean, obviously, uh, people are doing it. It's just um, hasn't really been packaged in a way that makes it easy for a neophyte to just jump in and do it. So that would be my on my wish list. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Yeah, absolutely agree. There's so much more that can be done, and uh, it's it's really hard to push something over the limit where it's very easily accessible to 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 everyone. It's you know if. It's like designing a product for you know mass commercialization. It's you know it's nice to have a prototype, but the hard part is how to you know make it accessible to everyone and really kind of produce uh, large batches. Um, David has a comment. David, go ahead. Yeah, Peter, I'm quite happy if Dennis can put you and me in touch with each other. I've built several of these machines running on Linux boxes, and it's it's much more straightforward straightforward than it might actually initially appear to do. Um, so if you can uh, if you can reach out through Dennis, I'll happily spend as long as it takes to get the machine up and running with you. I'm going to immediately send an email. To hey, David, you. thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Dennis can be the intermediary and we'll uh, establish contact here. Did you cover I, that? I have used Dead scripts to do a single station install. The, the, the dilemma now is do I clone that user? And I'm not sure I have all the necessary pieces. I haven't really tried to run it in capture mode. So, but we are seeing inexpensive Celerons, 16 gig of memory, 11th generation Celerons, uh, 512 gig SSDs 
for like three hundred and twenty, three hundred and thirty dollars. Absolutely. Mean, goodness, that would, if you're going to buy five four hundreds, well, how many of those are you buying before it's cheaper to go the other route? Yep. And especially yeah. if you're using a, an approach like Lowell is using, with six six cameras representing an all sky view, but with RMS. Uh, four millimeter lens sensitivities uh, and, and have that on a single Linux box, that's gotta be less problems to maintain than five or six Raspberry Pis. So I, I, completely I really agree. think it's appropriate to move in that direction. Yeah, and yeah. they are much more stable than the, the Pis. Uh, there've been some cameras that were that are running on a Linux PC for years now without a single hitch. Um, it's just getting the, the instructions to a state where it's literally just download a file or run it and everything is done. That's something that needs needs a bit more work. And um, I would you know love if we could maybe assemble a team that can make that final final product. But from what I can support, I'm just gonna guarantee the pie. I cannot um, uh, commit to 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 much more uh, in in my workload. Uh, but getting a team together would be is a very really great idea. Okay. Yeah, I think uh, if, if I explain to Peter how to do it and Peter writes down what he did, then the, the shortcuts I might take, I don't even remember doing, but Peter will remember doing it because he's well, done it for the first time. Well, exactly. You need somebody who doesn't know what they're doing to write your documentation because that way you get it from a very simple level and you know, the idiot's guide to how to run four pies off my Linux box. That's, or, or four uh, cameras, I'm sorry, off my Linux box. That's, that's what we need. And there, there are people that are already doing that. Uh, and that's great. Like I say, Ed's scripts are, are wonderful, but I'm just, you know, stopping short of, of the uh, plug and play kind of install. Mm -hmm. And David, I'll be happy to work with you. Awesome. Uh, I put you guys in touch. I hope you got the email. Uh, if not, let me know. Um, I would just very shortly like to go through the list that of Derek's questions. I just want to specifically address to just make sure that we don't just leave it as some sort of a high level discussion. Uh, so he, he asked a question, designing a GMN network for Victoria, likely we will see an increase um, in GMN in Victoria. How do you go about designing the GMN coverage or for the matter, uh, Australia? We have cameras in the east and west, but not much in between, although the DFN network filled, fills the gaps. So uh, just some base uh, numbers to remember. And I already mentioned them before, but I want to all bit to kind of together uh, in this short discussion is the distance should be between 50 and about 300 kilometers between stations. Um, much shorter than that, and there's a pro problem of uh, the, the, the angle between the meteor. And th so the, the triangle that forms one station, the meteor, and the, the other station, that angle between the, the the, the, you know, the, the meter is at the top of uh, is called the convergence angle. And you can imagine if the cameras are very close together, almost, you know, at the same spot, you can't really tell where the meter is in 3D space. You can just tell it's along this one plane, right? So what you really need is to observe the meter from two different locations that are separate enough to be able to to realize where that line of the meter is in 3D space. Uh, and we found operationally that about 50 kilometers is the minimum. Anything shorter than that, and there are going to be issues. Uh, and much further away than 300 kilometers, then you're starting to get issues uh, of just simply, you know, you can't point low enough to, to sample meter heights which is a, a height of 100 kilometers uh, because you just kind of Earth's curvature, curvature gets in the way. And also if you're pointing really low, there's gonna be a lot of atmospheric extinction wherein the sensitivity is going to drop. So these are the magic numbers. Now, in terms of 
you know, the, the actual configuration, um, you can, you know, as, as long as you have the locations, you can point the cameras in a different way to optimize the, the, the coverage. And that's what Gene's talk was all about. Um, Derek, you have a question. So, um, so responding to that, so Victoria across, you know, we're talking about thousands of kilometers. So, mm -hmm. um, so, so not hard to get in the 50 kilometers. So, so really we probably should be looking at a network that's got a, a line of cameras 300 kilometers apart to the north and 300 kilometers apart to the, to the, to the south and just have them all overlapping. Is that, or is, is that too prescriptive? Do you, you know, do you, you best to find good operators first? Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, you can have a different configuration. So for example, in Victoria, you can have a cluster of cameras in one location and then a cluster in a separate location. They don't necessarily have to be touching. Um, for example, uh, in North America, there's a cluster of stations here in Southwestern Ontario, and then two separate clusters in uh, Southwestern US. Um, and it, it's really, uh, as I said before, the growth should be more organic instead of planned, um, because I, we find it very kind of hard to force cameras on people. So it, it, just getting people on board is the hard, hardest part. Once you, you, you get over that boundary, that's the problem is solved. Um, and the second uh, question that we didn't address yet is uh, other camera networks and how we interact and collaborate. And that's a very important point. Uh, there was a picture in the BA Winchcomb YouTube video where all different camera networks are shown on one roof. And I, I believe that's actually Jim's roof. Uh, is, is Jim still here? Yeah, he is. Um, um, I know in the UK there is a data sharing arrangement it would be nice to understand how that works and whether it is worth replicating in Australia and other countries. I think the CAMS network uh, uh, that in Australia is in Australia. There is an all sky camera at the site of the astronomical club, and the DFN could be active here. So, and yeah, we already discussed how the DGMN is different from uh, DFN, and there's a lot of informal collaboration. Uh, so maybe Jim can speak to his efforts of advancing collaboration between different networks because that's he's been the glue between different networks in the UK. Uh, very kind of you to call me the glue. I've never been called that before, uh, but yes, that is uh, that is my chimney that has the three different kinds of cameras on there, and I'm about to convert one of them to uh, a cams camera, so uh, that'll be four different kinds. Um, the Data sharing uh, in the UK came about as a matter of necessity with six different networks, five different technologies. We wanted to find meteorites. We're sometimes finding that um, each network would get say one observation and uh, we wouldn't even realize that there'd been a really interesting event in, in one case until six weeks later. So we've got that sorted out. Uh, we got the um, technology uh, sorted out with a converter to convert data from any one uh, type of camera to the other types of cameras so that we could exchange it. And then of course, uh, Dennis, with your um, high level of input, uh, created the ECSB format, which was based on the Desert Fireball format, um, but with a lot of input from uh, you to create a standard form for data exchange between all the different networks. So lots of networks are, have uh, implemented that now, including, of course, um, DMN. Um, the, uh, at the moment, everything is a little bit ad hoc. So we find out there's a fireball, we scramble around to find out what data we've got, and then we exchange it depending on who's available to work out what just happened. Um, we're getting more and more coordinated. So as Mark McIntyre mentioned, there's uh, an alert uh, system where data is put on the website of the network, which says uh, which camera triggered an event and another file saying what its um, field of view was so that any network can look at any other network and see, did they actually see an event and could it plausibly overlap? Um, in New Zealand, there are two networks. So there are the four DMN cameras and then there are um, three clusters of CAMS cameras in the South Island. 
And so getting those to work together is a bit of a focus now. And I've been in New Zealand for about a month or so, here for another couple of days. And so um, talking with operators of most of the New Zealand cameras to try and get something together. I've probably over answered that question, but if I've looked perhaps then do ask and I'll try and keep it more concise. Yeah, it's yeah, it's great. Uh, in terms of the, the CAMS collaboration, so the data produced by the GMN is fully compatible with the CAMS format. In fact, the the GMN grew out of our experience of using CAMS for several years. Um, and then basically, you know, we were uh, we couldn't understand why we have to run it on an expensive Windows computer where we have these Raspberry Pis, and we just wrote the software from scratch, and we didn't want to invent any standards and formats from from uh, from scratch again, and we just adopted the CAMS format as the standard format with some changes and additions. Uh, so, so Paul Rogerinski is actually running a network in in uh, Belgium uh, and the neighboring countries, and he shares his data with camps and we have absolutely no problem with that that's that's perfectly fine so if people in new uh, camps new zealand want to do the same thing uh they can get in touch and we're gonna help them out and i think paul can share his experience of how to actually do this transition and and how to how to do that and i think there's also camps in uh, uh in australia if you guys want to collaborate go ahead um and we can just uh try to you know make that collaboration as smooth as possible um we're actually closely co collaborating on some things with uh with peter jeniskins who's, who's the the astronomer at seti who's running the camps project so as you can see unlike in some maybe other fields of science meteors meteor people are very collaborative there's kind of very little competition. We're just kind of very excited when we have a nice, nice meteor in the sky. Yeah, we can we can all get yeah. behind that. Yeah, I, I get behind that absolutely. It's been great actually. The collaboration between the networks has been um, very uh, open and in a spirit of great cooperation to get the best science. So that's been um, something particularly brought out by the Winchcombe meteorite. With a few little bumps in the road but generally um an amazingly open and productive collaboration so yeah thanks to you for that Dennis. well yeah i mean it's uh we need to thank all people who are participating in the network and really working really hard to recover the meteorite and the amazing team at the the uh, uh, natural history museum and i believe that there are other scientific teams around the globe who are probably working on meteorites and would really love to get a chance to actually work on a fresh fall because they're always scientists or students who can really benefit from um, uh, from from that collaboration. Uh, so, David, you have a you have a comment. Go ahead. Yeah, just relating to a point you made earlier about uh, time stamping, is it worth improving the time stamping by putting in a dedicated clock? or is the network time protocol completely adequate? NTP is just fine, as long as the internet connection is stable. Um, there, there were many discussions uh, a couple of years ago where people used to run back then expensive GPS devices that made sure that the timing is extremely accurate, blah, blah, blah. And uh, it was actually one paper was part of my PhD where I investigated the timing differences between stations and how that influences the trajectory quality. And it turns out that even though you have very accurate frame time stamping, uh, you still need to synchronize the time between stations. And the issue is that the frame time is accurate. However, the video frames are not phase synchronized between cameras in, in the network. So you still have to do the time correction that's actually less than the, the, the frame time. So, and we actually found that the time between cameras can be off by a second or two uh that it is now uh just because of the, the way the network protocol works between the camera and and the pi and that actually has almost no influence on the accuracy of the orbit um because just one second in time translates to 15 arc seconds on the sky right 
And, but the, the thing is the radiant precision that you get is on the order of, let's say several uh, arc minutes. So in a sense, that's, it doesn't really matter at all if time is off by, by a second or two. Um, but as long as it's not off by more than that, there shouldn't be any issues. Great. So NTP is quite adequate. No need to put in a GPS clock. Yep. As long as you have a stable internet connection. So yeah. one thing that Paul brought up, and I think previous session is there are people in uh, certain countries and there was a guy from Cuba that, that contacted me recently. And, and we talked about getting, a, I said, well, no problem. I'm going to send you a camera. If you're very keen, you know, we can probably, you know, point it towards Florida and you're going to pair up with a camera in Miami, Miami, right? No problem. Uh, but the problem was that he didn't have a stable internet connection. So in Cuba, as far as he said, he has the internet connection for just a few hours during the day and nothing during the night. And that's a big problem for the Pi. And I said, well, okay, no problem. Uh, maybe if I can deliver like a GPS device to you, can you maybe connect it to Pi, install it? But he didn't have enough experience with the system to, 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 to make it work. So yeah, the internet, stable internet connection is not a necessity as long as you have some other way of getting the time. Um, okay. okay, yeah, no problem. Uh, Pete Eshman, go ahead. Yeah, I wanted to follow up on that. I know the old uh, parts list uh, included a uh, rather inexpensive Wyoming Quantity 10 uh, RTC module. Mm -hmm. So are you no longer recommending that if we have a decent network connection? Because um, there was discussion on GMN, I mean, yesterday and today about this, this very issue. And I, I kind of came away from that discussion very uncertain about uh, what the best recommendation would be. Yeah. Um... I, hmm. if you can have an RTC running, I would recommend that you have it installed because if something happens with the time on the Pi and reboots and there's no internet, at least time shouldn't be off by more than a few seconds. And it, it should be able to bridge that gap if you have some sort of an outage. Um, but if you really have a stable internet connection and if you have uh, like a UPS for the Pi or whatever, it shouldn't be a problem. Okay. Yeah, it should have good stable time. Um, it truly really depends on your, your, your local conditions. Uh, David, you still have your hand up. Do you want to say something? Oh. No, sorry. That was oh. just a mistake. Okay, no problem. Um, okay, um, any other comments, questions, suggestions? Uh, Bill Wallace, go ahead. Would anyone like to see my real-time screen? Sure, why not? Well, this is running on a Ubuntu Linux box, as I recall. No, it's running on the machine I'm talking on. If you see a red line, that's something. But this is this. I recreate the star system, count the stars, put the time up, up 10, and if there's a red line showing up anywhere, that means it detected something. So that's the, the real-time uh, meteor detector. Yep. Looks, yeah, looks pretty sweet. And seems to be running really fast. Hmm. So, so you're pulling the data directly from the Pi, or is it running, the software is running on your computer, right? Well, uh, I'm, run, I'm doing the session on the machine that runs the camera. Oh, runs the, runs the camera. And yeah. Run, I've got a high-powered machine. That's pretty cool. Yeah, even I remember when I was first developing RMS back in the day, my Linux laptop was more than capable 
of running a single camera without any issues. And the Pi was really, really slow, but it's, what can you expect from a $35 credit size computer? So Bill, we're seeing the star count change every new FITS file. Is that what's going on? Yep. So about every 10 seconds we're seeing this uh, yeah. star count in the upper right hand corner. Chart. Yeah. Uh, and if it isn't uh, above 20, I don't bother to do an analysis. Yeah, that's, that's the count that we found to work best. Um, so I can probably give you a very sneak preview of what the, re the next upgrades to the code are going to be, um, where we will actually track periods of night that are going, that are clear and have enough stars detected on them and not. And that's going to be used for the flux code. So let me just try to find uh, a new graph that I have here. Um, Nothing showed up, but anyway. Um, let me just share the screen. So, um, what we're going to do is, as I said before, compute fluxes of meteor showers. So for example, when you have the geminids, you, you really want to quantify how many meteors enter the atmosphere per 1,000 square kilometers per hour. And um, that is important because we want to track the activity if it changes over time. Um, however, we can only track that if the weather conditions are good. And we came up with a way of predicting very accurately what the number of detected stars should be in the field of view, how it changes because of just, you know, like the, the, the galactic plane comes into the field of view and suddenly you're seeing more stars or the different constellations change. Um, and then the software basically computes the ratio between the number of matched and predicted stars. And we say, well, you know, if it's about 50%, we call this clear skies. And if it's below that, we call that cloudy. Um, and it computes the observing time and then it applies a bunch of corrections to actually compute the, the so-called flux of meteors uh, in time. So you can see how the time changes. The flux stays pretty stable for the geminids. And this is in meteors per 1,000 square kilometers per hour. And these are the types of reports files that you can expect on your uh, machines locally for every meteor shower uh, that happens in the year. And there's going to be another tool on the website that's going to uh, that's going to be doing this. Um, it's just a very very sneak preview of of what you can expect. And these are some things that space agencies are very interested in to have a, kind of a real time understanding of what the activity of meteor showers um, is, but that's all that I can say for now. Um, okay, uh, any more comments? And if not, um, I think we can slowly, we can start to conclude this meeting. Uh, I wanna thank everyone who came uh, for the first, second, or both sessions. Uh, Paul has been on both, and I think it's really, really late in Europe, and he should go to sleep. Um, and <laughs> I'm, I'm in the same boat. So uh, thank you all for coming, and I hope to see you all next year. And if there's a need, we can even have a meeting um, in six months, but I don't know if I have time to organize it. And hopefully once this, once Corona is over and whatever, we're going to have an in-person meeting somewhere in some random place, but who knows when that's going to happen. Um, again, thank you all and uh, see you next year, if not sooner. Bye. Cheers.